Our first item of business is a summary of proposed zoning changes for the form based code Florence. But before that, I want to take just a minute. We have a new member of the planning board who is joining us for his first meeting. Um, and it's really a little bit tough to do this via Zoom rather than face to face. But um, Chris Tate, who you see in one of your uh, squares there, has just been appointed to the board. And Chris, I wanted to wondered if you wanted to just say a quick word um, about who you are and what you yeah, expect. Thank you, George. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is Chris Tate. I live on Upland Road in Leeds. Um, I have a degree in civil and environmental engineering. Uh, I am a registered professional engineer in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I spent about 14 years as a uh, civil engineering consultant, um, designing site plans, working on stormwater management systems and all that good stuff. Uh, for about the last four years now, I've been working for Bay State Health as a project manager um, throughout their health system uh, up and down the 91 corridor. So uh, I hope to, to bring that perspective uh, to the board, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to serve. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. So Chris is coming on board as associate member because there was a vacancy because our, our colleague Jana White was recently bumped up this planning board ladder to be a full um, planning board member. So congratulations, Jana. Um, <laughs> thank you. Anyone else need a little out of boy or out of girl today? <laughs> We're all set. Okay. So then yeah, let's sure. um, <laughs> let's um, move this over to Carolyn and maybe Carolyn can just give us a little context again for the discussion before we open it up and what we hope to uh, have achieved by the end of the hour or so discussion. Sure. So in November, um, um, there were two public forums held that the planning board um, sponsored about um, how we would look at um, modifying the regulatory structure for downtown and Florence Center. Um, and that was sort of to bring everybody back into the conversation mm -hmm. where there had been um, a bit of a a lull um, that um, COVID helped um, push <laughs> forward. Um, and so there, we separate at that time, we talked more conceptually about the um, form-based code um, um, options and sort of the framework for downtown North Northampton um, separately. And then we then followed that with just a focus on Florence Village and um, what a form-based code um, component could look like for Florence Village based again on public comments that we had went back two years. So this conversation sort of brings both of those form-based code components together um, for a conversation uh, more about sort of the nitty gritty details uh, before the any kind of um, zoning packet gets submitted to city council. So um, we have Dodson Flinker back um, to talk and to really go through in a little bit more detail about the um, what's going to be in the code and how that varies from the existing um, code review and from sort of the standard zoning that we have in place and what are the similarities and, and where it sort of departs a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Dylan Sussman, who's with Dots and Flinker to start um, that process and talk about how the two pieces um, of the form-based code that um, look at the two different sections of Northampton sort of come in this umbrella um, coding. And Carolyn, before they take the mic, sorry, Dylan, um, just to remind if there's anybody from the public here for the, an application of continuation 
on for Nonatuck Street or for um, Lincoln Avenue, those won't begin um, until 830. So this discussion right. will continue for quite some time. So you're welcome to, you know, come back then or please join us in this form based code discussion. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Thank you for having me planning board and thanks uh, members of the public for joining us. Um, as Carolyn said, this is a project that um, we've been working with Dodson and Flinker, which is a local landscape architecture and planning firm based in Florence, um, have been working on for about two years. Um, so we're really excited to share this update with you and get any feedback you have. This is gonna be a, a breeze through the zoning, which is, um, you know, it's zoning, it's, it's, we try to make it as simple as possible, but it's still complex. Um, so this is kind of a, a technical walkthrough, I guess. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and, and give you a little presentation. Um, and I expect the presentation's probably about half an hour-ish long. Um, and then we can talk about what you see after that. Okay, so here we are. It's December 10th. Happy Hanukkah to those of you who celebrate that. Um, so like Carolyn said, last time we, um, the last two public forums, we looked at Northam downtown Northampton and Florence Saturday, and we went through the planning implications of various public input we had got. Um, you wouldn't mind muting yourselves if you're uh, I was suspicious. Alan, that would be you. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm not going to re review that in detail tonight, um, but I'll touch on it and just try to catch people up a smidge. So as we talked about last time at the last two public forums, there's basically a broad overarching goal for these zoning changes or regulatory updates. Um, and I think that's encapsulated by this, which is to make the zoning more flexible to respond to current and future market demands while advancing walkability, diversity, and economic resilience, and to improve the predictability for applicants and the general public. Um, so key concepts there are flexibility, predictability, um, walkability, economic resilience, and diversity. Um, so there's this kind of tension and a continuum between flexibility and predictability in zoning. Um, and with this proposed zoning, we're trying to find the middle ground. Um, so if you have something that's very, very predictable, it's gonna be very prescriptive by, um, by necessity, um, which limits the flexibility for applicants. On the other hand, if you have zoning that's wide open and is very flexible, it's not gonna be very predictable for applicants and it's also not gonna be very predictable for abutters or other people in the city. Um, so what we're trying to do with these zoning changes is to um, simultaneously make the zoning both more flexible and more predictable. Um, and again, to find the, the spot that's right um, for downtown Northampton and downtown Florence. Um, so on the flexibility side, the th here are some key things that the zoning changes do. Um, most things are allowed by right with objective design standards. Um, that's similar to how downtown um, central business zoning works now. Um, it's not as true for some of the other parts of the um, downtown Northampton, like um, the general business part of Pleasant Street or Florence, which is also general business currently. Um, so it's gonna tailor standards by dividing the central business district in Florence center general business district into sub-districts, right? So right now, the central business district is kind of one size fits all. We can make it more flexible by having sub-districts so that the standards are, are tailored. They're not all the same. Um, Third thing here is reducing the area that's subject to central business architecture committee review. Um, there's a certain amount of inherent uh, um, prescriptiveness in the central business architecture review. 
Um, and so by limiting that area, it loosens up some of the things that are allowed for building design in, in, in downtown Northampton. Um, fourth thing related to flexibility, um, we talked about this in both public forums, is the idea to um, require commercial use on the first floor in the core of downtown, which is basically Main Street, um, and key nodes in Florence Center, Maple and Main and Chestnut and Main and around those areas, but not in the remainder of downtown or Florence. Um, so that makes the use of ground floors more flexible and responds to current market trends, which um, basically show a, a decrease in demand for retail and other sort of ground floor commercial space and an increased demand for residential space. On the predictability side, we've got most things again, being allowed by right with objective design standards, right? So that's both something that does achieves flexibility it also achieves predictability. There's a balance there. Things are by right, um, that's flexible, but they're objective design standards, that's predictable. Um, and that's kind of the key concept behind the zoning. Um, uh, also on predictability, the zoning has a lot of diagrams and illustrations, which hopefully will make it easier to use both for applicants and for the planning board. So those, those illustrations, the diagrams show what's desired in a way that just words don't. Um, and also they um, show how language should be interpreted when sometimes it's hard to, to, hard to describe things um, related to the built environment. Number three, um, the zoning clarifies the requirements for design and use of the public right of way. Um, so that's streets and sidewalks. It's basically sidewalks. Um, on the design side, we're talking about things like tree planting standards or um, what to do when an applicant deserves a sidewalk, how should they rebuild it? Um, and then on the use side of the public right of way or public realm, we have things like cafe seating on sidewalks. So that's a private use of public space. Um, so the zoning goes into that and what um, standards there should be for some public uses, some private uses of public space. Um, number four, um, clarifying requirements for pedestrian oriented design of space between the sidewalk and the front of the building. Um, so we talked a lot about this in the past forums and the forums that preceded that and the focus groups that came in between. Um, that for both downtown Northampton and Florence, these are Northampton's key walkable village centers. That walkability is a important thing for sustainability. It's also an important thing for the economy of the city. Um, walkable centers are competitive because they're walkable and because they're appealing and attractive. Um, and that space between the front of the building and um, the edge of the sidewalk becomes really important. Um, you know, in, in downtown Northampton, you have in, on Main Street, you've got buildings up to the edge of the sidewalk, basically. Um, but in Pleasant Street, Lower King Street, or Florence, there's more variability where buildings aren't necessarily up to the front of the sidewalk. And so what do you do in that space and what's acceptable, what's not? Currently, the zoning has some requirements, but they're fairly vague. Um, and I would imagine that the planning board sometimes has trouble determining what's acceptable and what's not. And so this, this proposed zoning tries to spell it out pretty clearly while also allowing flexibility for use of those spaces. Um, number five, um, building design. So the zoning provides more objective standards about building design to be used by the planning board for site plan review and also to be used by the Central Business Architecture Committee for, um, for along Main Street, essentially, for the core of downtown. Um, and then it adds, uh, it moves some of the objective standards from the Central Business Design Manual to zoning. And again, those apply to um, what we call Central Business Core. And I'll show you that in a minute. And then finally, um, the proposed zoning establishes the standards for large development, redevelopment projects that may require the functional equivalent of streets. I told you, this is getting technical. Um, so what that basically means is there are some sites 
in downtown that could be redeveloped at a larger scale um, where somebody may assemble parcels and there's potential for basically the creation of something like um, a new small network of streets. And so what does the city want from that? Um, it may be that these things go through subdivision review, in which case subdivision regulations say what the street should be. But it may also be that they don't go through subdivision review. Um, and so this establishes standards for things like block length um, <clears throat> and access that would deal with the functional equivalent of streets. OK, moving on. So this is the, oops, this is the project extent for downtown. You, if you came to the past forums, you saw this before. Um, so currently, there's a mix of zoning districts in this area. The red in the center is the central business district currently. Um, there are a couple of areas of URC that um, the zoning picks up. And then there's a large block of general business at the southern end of Pleasant Street and entranceway business at the northern end of central business before it becomes highway business. So that's basically like um, North Street to stop and shop is the entranceway business currently. Um, so all of these areas get rolled up into a new central business district that has sub-districts. So at the north and the south, there's a sub-district called Central Business Gateway. And in along Main Street, essentially from Holly Street to South Street, um, and then stretching a little bit up in King Street, like a tiny bit, tiny bit up King and a little bit down Pleasant Street, there's what's called Central Business Core. <clears throat> and then the remainder of what was um, central business becomes, ooh, becomes central business side street. So this lighter pink here is central business side street. And that's the area that will be um, no longer under the jurisdiction of the Central Business Architecture Committee, which is a, an additional level of review beyond zoning that's currently in place. In Florence, <clears throat> Uh, we're talking about the general business, what's currently general business and um, office industrial district. So that's, this is Main Street, Florence here, AKA Route 9. This is Chestnut Street, Cooper's Corner is here. Um, this is North Maple and Maple Street. So this is the Birds Store, um, Valley Medical Group, Florence Bank, and so on. Um, some of you may know Artifacts, Artifact Cider, that's over here. Um, so big old mill building, big old mill building, mill building, and then a smattering of other uses. Okay, so in Florence Center, um, there are two districts, or there's one district, Florence Village, with two sub-districts, Florence Village Center, um, which is at the two key nodes I described earlier, Chestnut Street and Main Street, and then Maple and Main Street. Um, so Florence Village Center and then Florence Village General is the rest of what was general business. Okay, so I'm gonna now start walking you through the proposed zoning. Um, the idea in doing that is to give you the basic concepts. So if you choose to go and read through it on your own, um, you'll have a sense of what it's doing and how to approach it. Um, so there are two new sections that would be added to the zoning, um, 35021, which is called character-based zoning standards, um, and 35022, which is called character-based districts. So the reason for those two sections is that one of them basically establishes standards and then um, and creates the form-based code framework. And then the second one establishes this, the districts and customizes the standards to those sub-districts. So the idea is that um, we're able to wrap up both Florence and downtown into you know, the standards for those into 35021. And then we apply them mostly through tables um, in 350.22. So it's kind of similar to the way the zoning currently works where you've got a whole lot of standards and then you've got um, 
dimensional tables and use tables, which in Northampton are often combined. Um, so it's kind of similar to that framework. Um, the character-based standards have things like purpose and intent and applicability and a regulating plan, which you've, you've, that's, those are the maps, you've already seen them. Lot standards, um, those are kinds of things you're familiar with, like setbacks and so on. Um, it establishes parts of the public realm, and I'll explain that later. And it establishes character-based standards in general and kind of how you measure those things. Um, and then 35022 establishes the subdistricts, and then, like I said, it customizes those standards to the subdistrict. Um, whoa, a very, very sensitive mouse tonight. Um, so this is an example of how it works. So on the left there, you've got something from 35021, and on the right, you've got something from 35022. Um, so on the left, we've got a diagram that shows um, a ground floor use limitation. Um, so this is basically like a diagram showing you that commercial uses may be um, required in the front part of a building. Um, and then there's all there's some text that describes what that is and says that you know the ground floor use limitation is the first 20 feet behind the building facade or something like that. I don't actually remember the exact number, but I think it's 20 feet. Um, so that section establishes it and tells the planning board how to measure it and gives a diagram so it's pretty unambiguous. And then the other section, um, this is showing you the table or part of the table um, for the central business district. And it shows you, um, you've got the districts along the columns and then the standards in the left column. So ground floor use limitation, it says that um, the minimum required depth is 20 feet in the central business core district. It's zero, in other words, is not required in the side street. Um, and then it's zero in the gateway, it's not required. So that's just one example of how this works. Um, here's another example. Um, these are some lot standards. So there's a diagram showing you some new terms that um, are part of the form-based code. So there's this term of the lot frontage zone. Um, and I'm going to show you some more images of that later, but it's basically <clears throat> essentially the area between the edge of the public right-of-way and the edge of the maximum front setback. And then there's another thing called the building, uh, the build-to zone. Um, it shows you this idea of building frontage occupancy. Um, showing that the building has the mass of the building and that the, the part of the building that's um, occupying the frontage zone is the building frontage occupancy. And then there's another graphic that explains that a little bit more that um, there's a minimum frontage occupancy standard where you've got the lot width here, right? The lot um, boundaries are shown with a red dashed line. Um, and to get the minimum frontage occupancy, you divide the frontage of the building by the width of the lot. Um, and then there are standards in the table that say um, you need 90% building frontage occupancy in the core, 75 in the side street, and 50 in the gateway. Um, so that's another example of how this works. And that's a pretty you know, key concept for um, trying to ensure that buildings fill as much as possible the front part of the lot, um, which is a key characteristic of the walkable downtown or village center. Um, okay, so I told you that there's a big focus on what, we're, what we call the public realm. Um, we talked a lot about that in the past two forums. <laughs> So the, the proposed zoning establishes different parts of the public realm, and it does that so it could apply standards to those different parts. Um, so it establishes six parts of the public realm. In the middle of the diagram here, you've got the vehicle throughway, number one. Then you get into what's called the street enhancement zone. In an area with on-street parking, that's basically the on-street parking lanes, and also curb bump outs. <clears throat> 
Um, after that, you get to the furnishing and utility zone. So that's on Main Street in Northampton, that's basically the brick strip um, where you might have benches, street trees, bike racks, um, mailboxes, street lamps. Then you have the pedestrian through zone. That's what we colloquially call, colloquially call the sidewalk. It's a place we walk that's you know, maintained free of obstructions for us to walk on. Um, then you get into the public frontage zone, which is if there's any leftover space between the edge of the required width of the sidewalk and the, um, then the property line, that would be the public frontage zone. And that's an area that's basically would be used for accommodating um, door swings or other transitional elements between the front of the building and the sidewalk in a place like Main Street, Northampton. And then you get into the lot frontage zone, which is um, what you saw over here, right? Um, this is the lot frontage zone. Like I said, it's from the edge of the public right of way to the maximum front setback. Um, and from the perspective of these form-based code standards, that's the area of private development that they're most concerned with because the, the form-based code standards are, are geared toward um, ensuring an active, a pedestrian-friendly environment. Um, and they're, they're about the design, how the, the interface between private development and public space. Um, Okay, one thing I, I neglected to mention earlier that I should probably say now is in general, what this is doing is it's adding standards related to form. There are still standards in the current zoning that will apply. Um, so things like some of the parking standards will still apply or environmental performance standards still apply. Um, some of the standards in the zoning about sustainability still apply. Um, so it's not like this is, throwing out all of the awesome zoning Northampton has. It's adding some new stuff to it and trying to streamline a lot of what's currently in the zoning, um, especially the parts of the zoning that are um, more difficult to interpret and apply. Okay, so here's another um, table on public realm standards. Um, so what this is doing is it comes immediately after the one above. And it has those zones across the top, and then it has a set of um, types of things that could go in the public realm, like um, street trees and tree pits or public seating or bicycle parking. And it says where in those zones these things belong, or where they're allowed, right? So we allow bike parking pretty much everywhere except for the vehicle throughway. Common sense, right? Um, so, Cafe seating, we allow that in the furnishing utility zone or the public frontage zone or the lot frontage zone, but it's not allowed in the motor vehicle lanes and it's not allowed in the pedestrian throughway because that would block the passage of people walking or driving. Um, and then in the far column on the right, it has um, either an A or a B. And so some of these, these are essentially keyed to like subsections of the zoning. And some of these things are, um, if it's an A, if the applicant basically proposes the thing or they disturb the thing, then the standards apply. Um, if it's a B, it's um, required for projects that are subject to site plan review. Um, and some of them are both A or B. So an example, cafe seating is an A. It's not required by site plan review. The city is not gonna say you're, you, you need to have cafe seating, but if somebody wants to have cafe seatings, there's, there are standards that apply to it. Okay, so moving on, this is just an example of what the code looks like. So this is a, two pages from the code dealing with street trees. Um, you can see there's some diagrams, there's a table which establishes standards for um, tree spacing that's recommended standards for the size of tree pits, um, both the width, the length, the recommended soil volume, and so on. Um, so there's a fair amount of detail in here that's um, 
there because trees have a hard time surviving in an urban environment. And so these standards um, will, if followed, will give the trees better chance of surviving. Um, this is an example of, of two pages that have to do with cafe seatings. So again, you have some diagrams, you've got some standards in a table, then you've got some design standards that are verbal and some examples of what this looks like currently in Northampton. Um, going back to the lot frontage zone, which is again, a pretty important part of this, the space between the building and the front of the lot. Um, so this is on the left, there are examples of um, graphics showing, trying to show where the lot frontage zone is to make it clear. Um, so the one on the top shows a, a building where, uh, uh, a lot where the building's right up against the street and the lot frontage zone is shown in six there. And then another example where maybe the building is set back from the street, um, but you still have that lot frontage zone up against the edge of the public right of way. Um, so here are some examples of graphics that show the kinds of things that are allowed in the lot frontage zone. Um, there are some pretty minimal standards for, for these. Um, so you can have, um, a sidewalk extension, right? Like something that looks like it's the public sidewalk, but it's actually private property. Um, there's an example of that in Florence, in front of um, Florence Bank, where um, it used to be demarcated with some cobbles that this was Florence Bank's property, but you could still functionally walk on them, right? Um, now it's been replaced with concrete, so you can't tell where Florence Bank's property ends and the city right away starts. Um, there's some, there's some uh, diagrams in the zoning that have callouts on them, including these two shown. Um, that's because we used to have detailed standards that went with the callouts and based on the feedback that we got in the public forums, we removed those detailed standards, but we haven't updated some of the standards. So if you're going through the zoning and you see callouts, but nothing that they're referred to, that's why. Um, we'll remove the callouts in the future. So you could have a, a sidewalk up to the, between the building and the, and the lot line. You could have a pedestrian plaza. Um, you could have a portion of the building that sticks out from the front, that'd be called an, a gallery. Or you could have a portion of the building that sticks out from the front that's you know, a portico or a porch. Um, or you could have a garden. And like I said before, there, there are other ones um, as well. Um, just trying to give you a sample of what's in here. And these have some pretty minimal standards associated with them. Um, then the code moves into building design. Um, it sets standards related, related to height. So, you know, the, what's an acceptable ground floor elevation of a building. Um, this came up last time in the Florence, um, in the for, forum for Florence, where people were talking about accessibility. So, you know, trying to minimize the grade difference between the sidewalk and, and the floor elevation makes a building more accessible. Um, obviously there are locations where it's not possible to minimize that difference because uh, you have a sloping lot or so on. Um, so there's flexibility for that built into the zoning. Uh, the upper left, you have the idea of maximum street enclosures. So the idea here is that um, Streets won't be excessively enclosed by building or excessively shaded by buildings, um, that buildings beyond a certain height will step back. Um, and that, that an applicant do, can reduce that enclosure um, either by pushing the building back, the front setback back, or by stepping back the upper stories or both. Um, and those standards are customized by district. Um, there are standards for roofs and there are standards for subdivision of facades. The one on the bottom right is actually adapted from the central business design manual. So this is a graphic that we kind of redid to try to make it clearer. Um, and it's presumably would be moved from the central business design manual to the zoning and it applies to the area that um, central business reviews, central business architecture reviews. Um, so basically everything that seemed pretty objective that's in the central business design manual gets moved into the zone. Um, 
continuing on with building design, there are standards for various kinds of ground floor facades. Um, there are basically four of them, four ground floor facade types that are established. So we have here the storefront ground floor facade type. So this is what you have up and down Main Street in Northampton in the Bird's Block in Florence um, or across the street from Bird's Block on all four corners. Um, then you have, um, Carolyn, there's some people in the waiting room. Um, then you have what's called a commercial front. So this is providing for commercial uses that don't necessarily need a storefront um, and wouldn't benefit from a storefront. Uh, we talked about this last time where you might have a building that was designed with a storefront because the zoning has been calling for it, but now it has a, um, a lawyer's office in it and they have the curtains drawn. Um, whereas if the windows were elevated a little bit, they might feel comfortable leaving their curtains open. Um, I work, I work when I'm not at home um, in a building in Florence that has that characteristic, right? It's, it's got elevated windows, we're an office, but we're comfortable being close to right next to the street and having the, sh the shades open because um, people are looking in at what we're working on on their computer. Um, the residential type is, like it says, for residential buildings. This is pretty common in the side street area and in um, Lower King Street. Um, the buildings don't have to be these traditional, you know, historic structures. That's just what exists currently in Northampton. So those are the examples that are shown. And then there's a civic um, ground floor front type, right? So these buildings don't fit the pattern. Um, and that's kind of on purpose because they're special buildings, they're landmark buildings. Um, and so basically these ground floor facade rules are kind of thrown out the window for um, civic uses in the zoning. And there's a special permit to allow them to be thrown out the window um, for non-civic uses if the planning board really feels like it's appropriate. Um, and by civic uses, I mean things like churches, city hall, the academy of music, um, the art museum at Smith, um, you know, a theater. These are all like cultural institutions. Um, they have a special place of prominence, both in their siting in Northampton, in their site design and in their building design. Um, and that's something that would be worthy of continuing. Um, and this is a table that goes with those um, ground floor facade types that I showed you. So it talks about things like the distance between fenestration, which is basically glass uh, on the ground floor, how much glazing there needs to be by percentage, um, how far into the building you need to be able to see behind those windows and so on. And then this is the last one here, I believe. Um, so last one here is this is another example of things that have been moved from the central business architecture design manual into the zoning. Um, so the central, this already is required. This isn't adding anything. It's just cleaning up the graphics a little bit um, and moving it to the zoning. Um, so this is about upper floor windows um, in the central business core. And this is an example of something that makes a lot of sense to apply to what we're now calling the core, but maybe doesn't make sense to apply to some of the areas that the central business district has, has grown into over time. So some of the side street areas um, and so on. Okay, so that's a walkthrough of the zoning. Um, there's, there are other things in there too. Um, I just was pulling out some examples for you to try and give you a taste of it and also to give you a sense of some of the key things it does and how it's organized. So again, if you go and look at it, you have, you have a place to start. Um, so does anybody have any questions or comments? Hello, uh, Sarah Northrup here. Hi, Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Hi. Um, 
Thank you for the presentation, Dylan. And um, so one of the things I've noticed uh, while hearing applications on the zoning board for years is when you have folks, uh, whether it's a homeowner or a developer, they are really trying to meet the standards. They're really trying to do what's allowed and um, not break, break the bank to do it. Um, so I like the way you've, you're you're taking standards and you're basically codifying them so that you don't have the unpredictability. Um, what I'm wondering about is something that I've seen before, uh, an issue we're having, you know, I'm having personally in the Bay State neighborhood, uh, is previous zoning changes um, were done and uh, the effect, the actual effect um, you couldn't really tell, you know, allowing more infill means, okay, more infill, but exactly how much? And we actually have the ability, I think, with uh, GIS and uh, data crunching to really figure out what the effect could be, which, um, you know, in Bay State, we're feeling the effect of some intense focus of uh, development that could theoretically have been predicted um, just by looking at uh, GIS. So here's a situation where you're making some changes. Um, have you looked at, um, and I'm sure Carolyn could uh, chime in about what um, what are some of the things that you, you're incentivizing now, or we would be incentivizing if assuming this is adopted, um, the kinds of changes that would be starting to happen because of this. I mean, you know, I might go in there and start looking at, ooh, look at these lot lines and ooh, look, ooh, what if I did this and this? And how could I, you know, uh, do something really cool based on these new incentives? Could you speak about what these, what you're trying to sure. incentivize here? Carolyn, do you want to answer that or do you want me to? Thanks. Well, I can, I, I can certainly start. Um, I think the um, the idea really is to create more flexibility from the user standpoint as well. Um, one of the issues that we've heard more and more about uh, recently and certainly um, as it relates to um, <clears throat> how we're going to sort of bounce back from this COVID era is that we, um, need to be more flexible in allowing residential uses in the in, surrounding the downtown in the core areas. Um, and right now the zoning as it stands restricts ground floor residential uses in both Florence Center and downtown. So um, in terms of uses, uh, we uh, believe that it's important to create opportunities for more residential development um, in downtown where it makes sense off the main streets and not in those areas where it makes sense to concentrate commercial development. So um, from that perspective, this proposal would really um, allow flexibility for that opportunity um, outside of the core main street areas. Um, the proposal doesn't change any of the current um, lot size requirements or setbacks or heights or anything that would uh, that might result in um, greater build out on a lot by lot basis. Um, and it really um, creates standards for designing more about um, how the, those uses and those buildings function and relate to the public space more than um, trying to create um, one um, more intense type of development versus another. So it's not really changing the allowed uses except for that residential component. And it's not changing any dimensional criteria or provisions about um, open space. It's really more about how to treat those areas. Yeah. The only thing I'd add to that is just that, um, you know, zoning to be 
the JIT has to be based on a plan. And the comprehensive plan or the, the master plan or comprehensive plan for Northampton um, talks about concentrating development in existing village centers in downtown. And it does that, you know, based on an extensive public process and so on. And it does it for good reason, which is these are the most sustainable places to, to have development in Northampton. Um, so, you know, I think that what Carolyn said is key. We're not really changing the lot standards. So it's not, um, it's, it's not really like allowing more density. Um, but it is trying to take advantage of the development potential that exists that may be being, be being blocked currently by the zoning or stymied by the zoning um, so that we fulfill the goals of the master plan, the sustainable Northampton master plan. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. Um, so one is just, um, uh, on one of your slides showing, um, kind of in what I'm going to get all the verbiage wrong, but what, what <laughs> zones of the public space, uh, these different, you know, could you have cafe seating versus, yeah. you know, bike parking and so forth. And one of them I think was tactical urbanism. What is that? Um, that actually has been removed from the zoning and I just forgot to remove it from the table. So okay. don't worry about it. All right, fair enough. It's um, one of the changes we made since those public forums. Got it, okay. Um, the other is, and I apologize because I know you talked about this at a previous meeting that I was at and you probably talked about this at the Florence, um, the recent, uh, uh, meeting related to the Florence zoning and I, I wasn't able to be there for it, but looking at the um, Florence village core and then there are the, there are the, um, the, there's the zone around North Maple and the zone around Chestnut yeah. and then the space in between them that's um, general, I think. Can you mm -hmm. um, just walk me through again, the decision to block those two out and not try to sure. proactively create one full uh, core? Yeah. yeah the, the core. The key difference there really is just ground as a ground floor commercial requirement. Um, so ground floor commercial is required in these two center zones, but not in between. Um, and that's the main difference that it seems like um, there's a stronger need for residential than there is commercial. And we you know, it makes sense to really hold on to these two key nodes for, for commercial, um, but that allowing residential in between, if somebody wants to build it, <coughs> would be okay. Um, there, other than that, there are pretty minimal differences between the two areas. Um, we've talked about whether it makes sense <coughs> design standards, um, sort of more detailed design standards for Florence. Um, we got feedback in the first public forum we held for this project that people were interested in architectural design standards. Um, those currently, there aren't sort of more detailed architectural design standards for Florence, like there are for um, downtown Northampton, but if there were, that would be another difference that would, might make sense is to sort of, you've got this kind of pretty intact historic storefront fabric in this area. Um, so it might make sense to kind of try to continue that. It's not currently in the zone, but it's something that could be considered in the future. And oh, Dylan. Oh. Yeah. Just to just to confirm, so the idea is that there's nothing blocking commercial de development in between those two areas. It's just no. so it's not preventing that use. It's just opening it up to other potential uses if that turns out to be the direction that it takes. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I mean there. Yeah, exactly. I'm just checking to see if anyone else has their hand up from the public. Um, 
So Dylan, I'll ask while we're on while we're on Florence. I know downtown Northampton we have this zone, this area called Side Street, <clears throat> which uh, must provide for some flexibility around commercial and residential um, development. Yet here in Florence, I'm looking at that little section next to Cooper's like Wilder Street. Um, and I wondered why we didn't carry that concept up to the Florence village. Of Which concept? Of the side street, I think downtown. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Florence Village general district is pretty similar to the side street district. The standards for those are fairly similar. So it's, um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's kind of this, um, in terms of Wilder Place, the, so the, along um, Main Street currently is in the district, but Wilder Street itself, which is Wilder Place itself, which is a built out um, residential street that's predominantly single family. Isn't isn't included in the zone. That's similar to um, like we talked about in the down downtown floor and forum. You know, it's similar to Wilson Ave or some of these areas on Con Street that have existing um, residential neighborhoods. I don't think I answered your question. Or your no, that's okay. As long as if, if I understand kind of the guidelines for development there the Florence Village um, general is similar to what we are calling the side street yeah. um, zoning downtown. Yep, it is. Let me uh, real another real quick question. Um, and then maybe this is for Carol, and I'm sure for you too, Dylan. Have we walked this through the, the CBAC, the Central Business Advisory Committee yet? Um, they were, there was, they were invited and there were a couple of members who came to the public forum. We haven't gone to this level of detail to the committee. And this obviously was an um, open forum tonight. Um, so we do, um, particularly as it relates, I mean, we talked a lot about sort of shrinking the central business architecture review to that core area through the process of these public forums, but we haven't done a walkthrough like this. Thanks. George, I have a, yeah, I have a question. Go ahead, Alan. Hello. Okay. Um, I, Dylan, I, maybe I misunderstood this, but about design standards, did I did I understand that you're suggesting that there be um, size of windows, uh, distance between windows, height of windows, distance from windows to corners, that those would be in uh, incorporated into the ordinance? Yeah, so um, currently these I showed are in the Central Business Architecture Design Manual. And so they are, they apply to projects under their purview. Um, and yeah, is they would, they would move into the zoning and for projects, they would only apply in that Central Business Core District, which is Main Street and a bit of King and Pleasant. Um, and they would continue to be reviewed by the Central Business Architecture Committee. That seems to me to be extremely rigid, codifying um, aesthetic preferences um, as to how buildings should look. So what if somebody had a design uh, of, that did not incorporate these requirements? Would it require, uh, uh, I mean, what would it require? So these particular requirements are required currently um, in Northampton. Okay, I'm, I was not aware of that. Uh, I guess it's been since so long since it's been a new building built uh, downtown. Um, 
So um, yeah. I can answer that a little bit, Alan. Maybe it'll help. Um, uh, the requirements are um, currently through um, exist throughout central business Arch um, central business district and are is currently under the central business architecture committee jurisdiction. So these guidelines are there. There are guidelines um, generally for new buildings, or of, of course, if someone wants to do a st substantial renovation, facade renovation, um, these are um, currently applicable throughout the entire central business area. But over time, uh, um, you know, that central business area wasn't central business, wasn't that size 20 years ago when these, when these um, guidelines were initially adopted. And so um, the Central Business Architecture Committee has often, you know, wrestled with whether or not these same standards are appropriate in areas much, you know, two or three blocks from the main street core. Um, there is a provision in the current um, Central Business Architecture Review um, that says the committee can find that another design pattern may be appropriate given the context of where the building is located or the size and scale, et cetera. Um, the idea with this is that um, these particular components about um, window patterning would definitely be, uh, would still be associated and required for that core district under the Central Business Architecture um, jurisdiction. Um, there would also be standards for the other parts of Central Business that would be the side street and the gateway, but those um, review, that review for new buildings would come to the planning board. And similarly, the planning board would say, well, maybe these aren't applicable. So as you know, any new building that's more than 2000 square feet automatically triggers site plan review. So almost inevitably, um, most new buildings um, would be coming in for planning board review. And so you'd have this sort of as a framework from which to draw um, these concepts for, for window alignment, but that doesn't mean that there's strict standards in the side street and gateway that would be uh, need to be adhered to. Um, and, if, and the planning board would be reviewing that. But they would still stay the same for the core and they were frankly created because of the historic characteristics of the architecture on Main Street and the first couple blocks of Pleasant and King. Um, and so in that context, uh, remaining in that sort of spine of Main Street, um, you, you know, there are there may be the opportunity for one new building but it's really going to be about if someone wants to modify the facade of a building um, these standards would be applicable about how to think about you know refacing a building as opposed to you know looking at a brand new building yeah as far as planning board review as you know we stay away from imposing our design standards uh, on a project. Right, so this would be a change for the planning board for sure, because these would be standards that would be applicable that would the planning board would be reviewing. Um, and that and for both Florence Center and um, parts of the Central Business District in downtown Northampton. And would the planning board have the authority to waive them? Yeah. yeah, pretty much everything in this form based code, the planning board has an ability to waive by site plan. And, and the things in it, or many of the things in it, actually only really apply to projects that are subject to site plan. Dylan, all last hearing you had mentioned, um, I think these windows, these upper window dimensions, were those only for the, the, uh, the frontage side of the building? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so all okay. these floor, thanks for bringing that up. So like the ground floor facade types are, they apply only to the ground floor 
and they apply only to the front facade of a building that you know abuts a street. So it doesn't apply to the side of the buildings and it doesn't apply to the upper stories. It's really just that that would be next to the sidewalk. Um, that's kind of important interface for somebody walking along a sidewalk next to a building. Um, and for the most part, uh, all of the all of this zoning doesn't go beyond that um, maximum front setback, which is like five feet in the central business core district. It goes up to twenty feet in Florence. Um, so we're, it's really focused on like the first zero to twenty feet of a lot. Um, the only exception to that is some standards related to parking. Um, any, any other questions or comments? Yeah, let me ask a, another quick kind of a process question. Um, as this moves on to the city council, you would mention one area of if for chance there is any kind of large scale development in either Florence or downtown that uh, these form based codes would speak to that. But I don't think we're at that place now of um, or you're not at that place now of proposing any kind of design um, guidelines for those large scale developments. So does the city council take this up and we tackle that possibility down the road? Um, so what I was referring to there is just like, is like one page of the zoning that talks about um, establishing block standards for significantly development. Mm -hmm. um, so if somebody came in with a project that had multiple buildings on a lot or lots of a certain scale um, in which it would basically require them to be building something like streets, yep. even if those are private, it establishes standards for the blocks. And, and I guess what I'm asking is, have you drafted those standards yet? Or is that something that yeah. will happen? You have, yeah. okay. okay. Yeah. So planning board, the whole thing, is, maybe, oh, the sorry, whole thing is, is, is written um, and should be available for you to look at very, very soon. Okay. So Carolyn, um, help me out here. The next thing is for the planning board to hold an actual public hearing and then make a recommendation to the city council on these proposed, or are we making a recommendation this evening? And kind no, of pass it approval. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no recommendation this evening, except that if there are, if you have been able to absorb enough to feel like you have comments, either um, concerns that you think we need to look at in more detail, pull back from or anything like that, then we could take that um, and look at, look at those changes. The next step is really for um, us to work with Dodds and um, Flinker to um, finalize the language so that it can get introduced to city council and then once it's introduced to city council, council refers it to the planning board for public hearing. So it has to go through that step first. They would not, they don't consider it or have any conversation or discussion about it during the, the meeting in which it's introduced. It's just immediately referred out. And then that starts the formal public hearing process um, on the changes. Um, we would like to, um, try to do that in January um, to get it introduced so that it starts that public hearing process in February. I mean, and, and we've talked about this previously, but in large part, we there are projects that um, are adjacent to downtown in the Central Business District where um, there's a strong um, desire and push for ground floor residential. Um, so this would be a key modification to allow those projects to move forward. Um, 
so it's definitely something that um, we we want to keep you know um, moving ahead on. Good, and um, I'm sure some of us will do our best to do a lot of outreach then, because we want to make sure when that public hearing happens yep. that everybody in Florence and downtown Northampton has been flooded with notices that we will welcome their participation. Yep. Um, And this will be combined with a couple of um, zoning map changes because as um, Dylan showed on the maps, there are a couple of spots of office industrial zone right next to Florence Center. And then also there's a pocket next to um, downtown and central business district that um, with this, you know, we're looking at swapping the office industrial zone to central business or to um, Florence um, General. Uh, so that would be a component of this as well. Otherwise, the boundaries really aren't changing except for those um, office industrial um, mm -hmm. pockets and a couple of, I guess, general business, I should say too. Sorry about that. There's some general business that's zoned on Pleasant Street that would also come into play. Business. You know, um, I, I just can't, I keep thinking about what Jana was talking about in the Florence Village General. Um, can we look at that, those proposed zoning districts one more time? I guess I, I just don't understand why we wouldn't want to try to pull the entire Main Street, um, that whole corridor and kind of have it be one walkable corridor making it all Florence Village Center. I, I guess I'm just trying to understand that a little bit more because I see lots there that you have the, um, uh, Val, what is it, Valley Medical Group or whatever it's called. And, and you have the, um, there's that building with the big parking lot next to it over there. So these are, and then you have uh, the pizza place. So these are all kind of lots that could be developed in the future and we really don't want to pull those pull those buildings up to the street and have it be like one more one big block you would envision residential there possibly yeah so let me thanks for bringing that up if that wasn't clear i really really want to clarify that so um the kinds of the kinds of standards i described to you apply to pretty much all of these two districts, both downtown and Florence. So yes, the intent is very much to make Florence more walkable, more appealing for pedestrians. Um, so all the stuff about the area between the front of the building and the edge of the sidewalk, you know, making sure that when possible sidewalks are improved and street trees are planted and they survive, all of that pedestrian friendly stuff is included and it's required for, um, for the whole of Florence. The only thing that's not required um, for Florence, for the Florence Village General, um, the area in between, is ground floor commercial use. Um, so that's, be, you know, that's- Thank you, that was my disconnect. Thank you for yeah. explaining that. Okay. Um, and then, you know, there, there is residential use in these areas currently, um, so, there's there's a house here across the street. There's a house here, um, and I think the you know the basic the basic idea is that Florence needs people. It needs people to support the existing businesses, um, and it's a good place for there to be more people in Northampton. It's an appropriate location for additional residential development in Northampton, and that requiring ground floor commercial if there's not a market to fill those spaces um, just means you're not gonna get development because you know developers may not be able to afford to build a space that they're not gonna be able to rent. Could you also just walk through one more time what the frontage requirements 
would be for new buildings here. So if, you know, one of the existing buildings, let's say, you know, Friendly's or one of the pizza places, well, those aren't really good examples. Let's say one of the buildings that's pulled way, way back, um, has a huge setback, um, you know, got torn down and was replaced. Did the same standards from downtown Northampton apply where there's a kind of a maximum distance between a maximum setback so that we actually would be pulling those buildings up to the sidewalk. Because I remember one of the early conversations we had about this is just the abundance of parking in Florence and that a lot of it is street facing and wouldn't it be nice if we had buildings instead and you know storefronts and or just nice yeah. residential units with yeah. planters and stuff and parking in the back. So what does that look like in the future if those buildings and lots are redeveloped? Yeah, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, they're not in this presentation, but I think it's basically like a, um, it's a 20 foot maximum front setback. And the area between the, if you do set your building back, which is your choice, um, the area between the front of the building and the edge of the public right of way has to be completely used for pedestrian friendly things like those things that I, that I showed before. Um, so the idea is that this lot frontage zone, um, which is I described, um, has to be used for one or more of these things. It has to be used for a garden or a plaza or an extension of the sidewalk. You know, it can't just be leftover space that you um, don't consider in your design um, and use for whatever is the lowest cost maintenance item you can think of. Um, so, and to clarify, that would exclude parking as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Parking is um, not required, is not allowed between the front of a building and the right of way, um, and whether it's allowed in the lot frontage zone or not, I think is customized by zone. Um, and it's something that Carolyn and I have gone back and forth on a lot. So yeah, the intent is very much to have parking in the rear and to interconnect lots. Um, there are already standards in Northampton zoning that, that encourage interconnected lots. Um, I'm going to go back to my questions for you all, which are, you know, they're not questions for tonight, but if you do choose to take on the task of looking through the zoning, um, I would encourage you to think about these things, which are whether the zoning meets the goals of sustainable Northampton, um, whether it steers development towards implementing the vision and the planning direct directions described in the previous public forum, mm -hmm. like is it Jana? Um, the kinds of things you guys have been raising of like, is this really, is this gonna make Florence more pedestrian friendly? We've been talking about that. That's the kind of thing that really is good to think through and think through, um, you know, will the zoning do that? What's gonna work for that? What's gonna work against that? Um, what's easy to understand and what's confusing? Uh, does the zoning strike an appropriate balance between flexibility and predictability? And then finally, you know, just in general, do you support the adoption of the zoning? Um, and if not, specifically, what's got to change? Um, you know, and I'm not asking like, do you support every single little thing in there? But like overall, does it? First question is overall, are we heading in the right direction? Is this something that you know the planning board should be taking up? City council should be taking up? And then, you know, what are the straws that would break the camel's back? Um, so, you know, maybe for Alan, I don't know, but maybe for Alan, like having standards related to windows is just beyond the pale. It's not acceptable. Um, that kind of thing. Great. And Carolyn, when you send out this latest draft, will you include those four questions for us? So it'll help yes. guide, guide me when I'm reviewing it. Thanks. Yes, I can do that. Well, thank you. And, and Dylan, does your colleague want to add anything to tonight's discussion? Or is he just kind of monitoring your presentation? 
<laughs> I, I, I'm staying out of Dylan's way because he's uh, obviously very familiar with this and has presented it clearly, I think. Uh, but I am, uh, I'm tempted to jump in to talk about the planning background, particularly about the Florence plan, but uh, this is probably not the, the great forum for that. But I'm very pleased to see how this is working out and look forward to talking about it more. Thanks. All right, if there are no any other questions from the board or any of the public assembled, the, the planning board does have a few items that we might get to um, before our, our next hearings open up. Um, Dylan and Peter, thank you very much for staying on top of this for us. I look forward to being able to look at the next draft. Thanks for to your feedback and thanks for having us. Thanks. <clears throat> so does, um, planning board members, do you, anybody need a little break? Are we doing okay? Carolyn has a couple of small items that we could take up um, for five, 10 minutes or so before we open up our 8.30 hearings. All right, seeing nobody running out of the room. Carolyn, you wanna? <laughs> sure. Um, so the first item, um, and I'll put this on the screen, it is an, um, it's an um, a &R that was submitted on um, for uh, um, Dryad's Green. Um, let me just pull this up. Uh, it's actually just to um, carve off um, a larger parcel and um, distribute the parcels to the abutting um, uh, neighbors. Um, so let me just share that uh, with you. Um, and let me see if I can rotate this. <laughs> I just realized this could be a problem here. Um, so I'm taking it off of our, it's not a PDF. Um, hang on, let me see if I can figure this out. So, um, I'm just gonna show you this. It, um, Kensington Avenue is over here. If you see my cursor, Dryad's Green is here. Smith College is up um, on this east side. You can see the north arrow going here. Um, there's a large parcel in the back that um, really uh, doesn't have, um, it has frontage um, connected to, uh, the back of the parcel is connected to this house number um, um, on, on Dryad's Green. So um, what the proposal is to take these rectangular blocks and give them or sell them to the um, houses along Dryad's Green here. So this is parcel A and parcel B. So it's not a subdivision creating a new street. Um, and they're um, just really um, shifting parts of parcels to other property owners. So I need um, a vote to, um, or a motion and a vote to um, have these, this plan endorsed um, for this um, new lot configuration. Thank you, Carolyn. Do you want me to zoom in at all? maybe see a little bit here. So this so, is 43 and 31 Dryad's Green. And that's not another separate property, be, uh, that little rectangle between the property in question and the house lot, is that? Yeah, yet let, a, me, let me show you on another map that might be um, easier to um, see what's going on because I think yeah. it'll show even the bigger pieces. So, um, uh, so this is the big piece that has this rectangular arm back here. This is Dryad's Green here. 
It's a little bit different orientation. I flipped the map, yeah. um, but these are the parcels here that will be gaining these bits here. So if you see this um, finger going back behind these two houses, this is the property owner. He's, um, they're just splitting off, oops, sorry about that. They're just splitting off these pieces and selling them to the property owner. That's helpful. Is there a motion that we could put on the floor for this? Um, Stubble more to approve the ANR. Let's just, um, okay. Sorry, Carolyn. Yep. So that was Alan that moved to have that endorsed. Was there a second? Second. Second. Okay. Jan or Melissa, take your, take your choice. Okay. So are there motions been made and approved? Is there any discussion about these A and Rs? Okay, hearing none, we'll take a roll vote because this is a Zoom meeting. Um, and I'll go through uh, as I see the people on the screen. So uh, Jana, how do you feel about this endorsement? Yes. Yes. Chris? Yes. Alan? Yes. And Melissa? Yes. Hello, Marissa? Hello, yes. Okay, David? Yep. Okay, and it seems like we don't have Krista or Sam here, right? I'm here. Sam, are you out? Krista's here. Oh, Krista. Hello, Krista. Hello, I say yes. Okay. Sam, are you out there? Okay. I don't think he's come in yet. All right. Okay, okay, and the chair says yes, so that's unanimous, Carol. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's also a review of um, a release of the lot sale covenant at Emerson Way. Um, if you recall, the planning board um, approved an amendment to the Emerson Way subdivision to allow affordable housing lots that were originally allocated for Emerson Way to be transferred to um, the Burt's Bog um, property that had 10 lots. Um, and because it had taken so long for the affordable housing lots to be built, um, to, to come to fruition at Emerson Way, the board applied a condition to the transfer of the affordable um, units to Burt's Bog. And the condition was that um, the affordable lots that were to be um, reserved for, um, sorry, the lots that were to be reserved for affordable housing at Emerson Way could not be um, otherwise sold and built upon until um, the city was assured that those affordable housing units would be constructed at Burt's Bog. So um, it was just another check to make sure after approving the transfer of those affordable lots to um, Burt's Bog that they would in fact get built before the, the location of where they were going to be at Emerson Way um, were sold for market rate lots. So the condition said that you had to see proof that a building permit had been pulled for the affordable um, lot, um, units at um, Burt's Bog. So the applicant um, at Emerson Way has submitted a copy of the building permit. They pulled building permits for all six um, units at Burt's Bog. So those building permits are now valid. They've been issued by the building department. Um, so now they're asking for release of the lot sale covenants at Emerson Way so that they can now um, start constructing the market rate homes at Emerson Way that were being, in, that were being held in reserve until those affordable housing um, building permits had been pulled. So I have a copy of the building permits. I'd be happy to show them to you. Um, but the way the condition reads is that the planning board has to see evidence that a building permit has been pulled. And then you can Carolyn, vote to release the covenants. Yeah. Can't a building permit be pulled though and then they never do anything with it? Doesn't it expire um, after a certain amount of time? 
It does, um, but the um, Rich Madowitz, who has been um, has been um, building out both these projects, Emerson Way, and then now has purchased the lots at, at Burt's Bog, um, has put a tremendous amount of um, resources into redesigning that project. Um, so it would really be um, a financial loss and burden if he didn't you know, take it to the finish line um, because right. he's put all this design money and acquisition into the Bird Spot project. Um, so I think, sure, there's always that risk, but he's already come this far. And in fact, the permit condition did say, you know, proof of a, pulling a building permit. It didn't say you have to start construction. Right. It just so worries me because he didn't follow through in Emerson way and came out of it by saying it ended up being too costly. So if he's pulled a burling permit on Burt's Bog and he waits long enough, and since we all know that construction costs are just rising exponentially by the week, can he then come back and say, well, I couldn't build them because it's so expensive. Now he's sold Emerson Way lots and we're once again without affordable housing that we were promised. Um, right, but he is also in, ha, has partnered with Habitat, who has been, you know, designing these. So that it's a different scenario today than it was. He had scattered site um, development at Emerson Way, so the houses were in different parcels spread around that subdivision, and he didn't have an entity that would actually do manage, you know, through at the end of the building to manage those um, units and. Um, um, make sure that they did meet the criteria for affordability. I think that was the, that's a big piece of the puzzle is having um, a, a nonprofit entity, frankly, um, take charge of um, overseeing that process of, of um, making sure that they've got qualified buyers and um, that they're sort of in the system and it's permanently protected. Um, He's put a lot of resources into this, so it does it. It doesn't make sense for him not to at this point. Okay. Well, Krista, that's a really good question, and maybe we've learned something about these conditions in, in this kind of scenario, you know, because that in another situation that might happen where then the building permit would just go fallow, and we would release the money. So. Hopefully you're on the board long enough to remember this when this situation comes up again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was Carolyn my first is... meeting ever. So I don't think I'll ever forget that meeting. <laughs> Carolyn, is this on lot 2526 that's being um, released? Well, actually he's asking for release for all three of the lots. So it's four or five, actually I'll, I'll um, I can pull up the, the specific ones, but it's that, so he had six units on three parcels at um, Emerson Way. And so he's asking for release of all of those because he's pulled all the building permits at Burt's Bog. Well, the reason I'm asking is whether I need to recuse myself if it's on 25, 26, because I'm representing the buyer of it. Um, yeah, that would probably be appropriate because that it is, that's one of the, that's one of the lots. So I will just um, mark that down. Thank you, Alan. Any other question from board members about this? Uh, Lot sale covenant release at Emerson Way. <clears throat> and if not, could there be a motion perhaps? I'll move that we approve the lot sale covenant release of Emerson Way affordable lots. Thank you, Melissa. 
or second? I'd second. Thanks, Marissa. Any discussion? Hello, Sam, welcome. Okay, then we'll take a roll vote quickly so we can get on to the next piece of business. Um, Jana, how do you feel about this release? Yay or nay? I'll vote yay with Krista's reservations, but may it go forward. Okay. Thank you, Jenna. <clears throat> and Chris? I, I vote yes if he meets the conditions that were set forth. All right. And Alan Burson is recusing himself from this. So, Melissa? Yes. And Marissa? Yes. Thank you, David? Yep. All right, and Krista? Um, yeah, I'll and say yes. Okay, Sam? And I abstain. Okay, and George will uh, say yes to one abstention, one recuse, and the rest in favor. Great. All right, thank you. So little items of business that we may be too tired to deal with later on tonight. So that was good, we squeezed them in. So at this time at 8.30, um, let's open up a site plan review meeting by Nora Kennedy and Chad Mirbergen for detached residential unit at 51 Lincoln Ave, Northampton map ID 25C-53. And do the applicants have a presentation for the board? Um, since this is our first uh, time ever being in front of this board, um, I don't know what you're looking for as far as a presentation, but uh, I, I'm ready to answer any specific questions. Um, if you could guide me uh, and maybe ask me a leading question, I'll be happy to answer it. All right. Thank you for your honesty and your approach there. Um, Carolyn, All right, how's you this have for a leading a... question? What are you going to do? <laughs> That's <laughs> lovely. <laughs> uh, <What? clears throat> Go so, ahead. Uh, can we, we, I guess we can see the plan. Uh, I can everyone, I guess I'm hoping everyone can see the plan. Yep. Um, we would like to we have a pre-existing dwelling that uh, was constructed at about the same time as our house, uh, somewhere around 1900. Um, it has fallen, uh, it's getting old and we'd like to uh, basically uh, replace it with uh, an in-law apartment um, because uh, Nora's parents would like to spend more time in Northampton with their grandchildren. So uh, we went through zoning uh, earlier today and they looked at the proposed location of the building and approved it. Um, and now here we are at this meeting. And uh, I, I don't know, is there anything else you'd like to say, Nora? Uh, not at this time. <laughs> There's so many people here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, some of the board members had a chance to go by the site and take a look at it and have reviewed the plans and the application. Um, any questions from the board members? And George, I would just like to say there were, so just to review this required both a zoning board permit because the location of the existing garage is, is as you can see from the plan as its closest point is 1.6 feet from the property line. Uh, the zoning board approved the location of the new structure at that same non-conforming <clears throat> side setback um, as it, because it, it's in comparison to the existing residential um, dwelling that's at the front of the site that is um, 1.3 feet from the property line. So all very close. Um, so the zoning board signed off on that. Your review is um, 
site plan because it's a detached um, residential structure on an existing property with a, a residential structure. Um, it's bigger than the standard accessory dwelling unit, which would, um, which is 900 square feet. And um, it, so it could, if it had been slightly smaller, the zoning board could have potentially reviewed both of those components together. But because it's larger than the current accessory dwelling unit um, size, it, it bumps into the planning board jurisdiction. The Department of Public Works did have a few comments about um, utility uh, connections and locations, um, which can certainly be, th those comments have been forwarded onto the applicant, um, which can be taken care of at the, you know, prior to the building permit um, issuance. There was another issue of um, DPW flag that there's a public shade tree at the front of the site um, that it's not near the construction site, but they're concerned about wanting to make sure that's protected. So um, it would probably be appropriate to have a condition that um, um, allows the city to sign off on the tree protection for that tree um, prior to um, um, any work on the site. Um, another component, which I relayed in my staff memo to you all is that, um, typic any, any project that, um, triggers site plan, um, review typically also trigger, uh, sorry, triggers, um, trap the requirement for traffic mitigation, but there are exemptions that the planning board could um, consider um, um, given that you know this structure could potentially have been attached to the to the building um, and not trigger site plan at all um, from the planning board so um, you all could um, um, should also sort of consider that parameter as it relates to traffic mitigation requirements Thank no you, question. The, the, the owner said it was an existing dwelling. Is it? And it, it's not an ADU currently. It's it's just a garage it's not, now, right? It's going to yeah, be. It's, it's going to be an ADU. Sorry, it was a it was historically a barn. There's still a mule stall in it, and they just they call it a garage. I won't. I won't repeat that to your mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't think, I mean, I, I don't think this should affect me. I can see this property from my own house. I feel perfectly fine. I feel like I can be impartial. But Were you on the abutters notification at all, Sam? Did you get a postcard? You know, I actually, weirdly enough, I don't think I did, but <laughs> I, I'm surprised because I have literally I was like, I was like, I fully can see their house. It's beautiful. <laughs> um, I can just it, check quickly. It might be a good idea if we have enough mm. board members here, then Sam, for you to recuse yourself following in Alan's footsteps today. It seems to be yeah. a routine. I mean, I'm, I'm not like exact, I'm, I'm around the corner and can see it. Pat. So I just want to, you know, let's. Yep. Um, Carolyn, what about parking? Is um, hmm. how, how many per dwelling unit? So the standard for parking <clears throat> is one parking space per thousand square feet up to a maximum of two required per residential unit. So since, so the single family house existing requires two spaces. The addition, this is just under a thousand square feet, the addition. Okay. So that only triggers one additional parking space. So a total of three. Which they have, right? Mm -hmm. Play, played out? Yep. Yeah. Mm. Right. I have a question for the, did you, I mean, it looks like you, were, you just decided to put it on the footprint of the existing garage. I don't know if that was for ease of permitting or coming to this meeting and saying that or not, or did you look at putting the parking between the two structures or? Uh, we did, but the reason we didn't do that is because there's a very old drain pipe that runs through the back of the, um, of, of the property. It runs like, you can see it on the, um, 
it's actually there's a drain so there's a, anyway there's a drainage setback that would not allow us to actually dig below so that that's the reason we kept it we had an initially hoped to push the building back and then realized we couldn't so you can put the asphalt but you can't put the foundation mold back there exactly got it yeah. okay and carolyn i just want to clarify um the barn or the stall or the historical building that's being removed did that need to go through the historical commission because of its age? So um, there hasn't been a demolition permit re um, yet requested, but anything older than 1945 gets a, at least an initial review. Um, so when they come forward to request demolition of the um, garage barn, um, then the subcommittee of the historical commission will take um, a, an initial um, look at it and see if it does need um, further review. Hopefully the applicants were aware of that next step. Yeah, it, wasn't I mean, a it, it, it sounds like all these steps okay. are part of the process in acquiring the, the permit. So, uh, if it, it, it is older than 1945. So. Hopefully it wasn't a mule that ran for president or something. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, and to be clear, the uh, utilities, gas, electric, water are separate from the main house, we correct? Oh. No. We want, we want to attach to the house. We want to run it through. Um, if, if we had to dig up the driveway to, to create, like to run from the road, that would be a, a non-starter for us, I think. It, it would be too expensive. So if we can't attach, then, then I don't think that this project is going to happen. Um, we would look at redesigning at that point yeah or maybe attaching attaching building Wh whatever yeah. like we, we we would need to yeah and carolyn i'm sorry I, i'm not sure if there's a requirement by dpw one way or the other for these um detached buildings um I, it varies um i don't want to speak about what the requirements are for the utility connections but um you know that's something that's a city standard. Um, so they would walk through um, that with the applicants. I mean, I did make some phone calls about it initially. Mm -hmm. I called, I mean, I called the electric company and I called, I called, I mean, I talked to David Valletta, I, I called a couple of people. Um, but uh, in my, so my, my sense was that we would be able to attach, uh, I mean, but nobody walked me through the very detailed, uh, process so i don't know I, I i only moved forward with this permit because i thought we could yeah so can't, um can't you just connect it by like a lanai so the, you can so i, I do mm -hmm. have a message here you i mean you can connect to and if you had a conversation with the city engineer um, who told you that you could connect it. They don't do the connections for electricity. So that's something that's separate. That's the utility company. But in terms of water and sewer, um, I am being told that you can connect through um, from your existing house. That won't be an issue. But I can't, and they can't speak for the other utilities. Of course, you're probably not gonna be able to connect to gas anyway, so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like that's all in the DPW comments. Mm -hmm. Yep. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, we might want to turn it over to the public at this point, unless there's any other questions from the board. Hearing none, is there anybody else here in the Zoom room who would like to speak in favor or any questions about this application on 51 Lincoln Street? Raise your hand. Yeah. I'd like to say something. Hello, Deborah. Go ahead. Hi. I'd like to say that I am so excited to hear about this project, even without knowing a lot of detail about it. 
this is exactly what I think the infill zoning was intended to do, to be allowed to make people's own property of better use to them. And I'm just amazed at how much time you're able to spend on a thousand square foot building. Uh, it's really wonderful to you know, see that kind of attention to it. So I'm all in favor. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak about this project? All right, we'll turn it back to the board. Any other questions for this, the couple, the applicants? Is there a motion perhaps? I would move to close public discussion. Thank you, Marissa. Second. Close that. Wow. Thank you, Jenna. So we're just, so what we've done is we've made a motion to close the public discussion. So uh, the public can't speak and we can't ask the applicant any more questions. It's a real procedural thing. Um, any discussion on the motion? <clears throat> All right, then we'll take a quick roll vote on that. Sam, a yay or nay about closing the public discussion? Thank you. Chris? Yes. Okay, Alan? Yes. And Melissa? Yes. Uh, David? Yep. And Krista? Yes. And Jana? Yes. Okay. And, and I'm sorry, Sam, I, I asked for your vote, but maybe you're gonna recuse yourself from this one. I wasn't quite clear on that. Not clear either, so whatever you want me to do. All right, it's a fairly straightforward kind of I, thing. I, I abstain, I don't, want to, I don't want to be part of it at all. Thank you, <laughs> good neighborly action. Okay, <laughs> so that we have closed the public hearing. Any more discussion for between the board? before a motion is made. Caroline, can you explain? So the traffic mitigation, we need to decide whether to waive the requirements there or not? Right, you can you need to determine whether this would be an exempt project under um, the mitigation requirements. Um, you know, from our perspective, uh, staff perspective, I think um, it does fit within that exemption language that um, you can exempt projects that wouldn't otherwise necessarily trigger site plan review, um, but for sort of one aspect. Again, this is, they could attach this if um, they wanted to and not come for site plan. So that would sort of um, uh, eliminate the traffic mitigation altogether. And then the only other thing to um, that uh, I would recommend and um, DPW does as well is that that um, tree protection measures be installed prior to construction um, in accordance with the city requirements for public shade trees. So, sorry, Karen, when you say that they, they could attach it, if they attached it, it would be just an addition to the house. It wouldn't be a separate dwelling unit. Yeah, it would be an addition to the house and a second dwelling unit, but that in and of itself wouldn't trigger site plan. So if, if they did an addition to their house, a 950 square foot addition to the house and created a second unit, two units are allowed by right in this district. So right. you wouldn't even see this project. It's just the, it's the existing non-conformance that's triggering all this. Or the fact that they're using the footprint of the existing the, It's the fact that it's detached from, so anytime you add a second unit to a property, um, oh, as I a see. second That's principal why structure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and on the traffic mitigation, you know, here in Ward 3, this uh, Lincoln Avenue has certainly a lot of uh, issues with truck traffic and cut through streets, but not hearing from any of Butters that const that uh, somewhat regular story about this development is going to create more traffic. I think we're safe to say that uh, we don't need you know that kind of mitigation at this point. Um, mm -hmm. They're only adding one space and it's going to be on the property. So I would, as a condition, I would certainly be okay with saying that we're waiving the traffic costs. Mm -hmm. 
I'll make a motion. Thank you, Alan. Um, so I'll move that we approve the um, site plan review for Kennedy and Mir Bergen, if I got that right. That's for, pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I did all right. Okay. I did all right. Um, for detached residential unit, 51 Lincoln Avenue, map ID 25C-53, um, and waive the traffic mitigation fee and require tree protection prior to commencement of construction. Thank you, Alan. Sounds pretty complete. Is there a second? I second. I'll second that. All right, Krista, I think you beat the buzzer there. <clears throat> Seconded by Krista. All right, any discussion on the motion? I have just one question. Oh, I'm sorry. We, why don't you ask Carolyn after the meeting, okay? okay? We yeah, need sorry. just to yeah. stick by that old protocol. Um, all right, hearing no other discussion from the planning board members, um, why don't we take a quick roll call? Um, Sam has recused himself, so Chris. Approve. Thank you. Alan? Yes. And Melissa? Yes. All right, Marissa? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Marissa. David? Yep. And Krista? Yes. All right, and Jana? Yes. Okay, so it's unanimous. Um, and the applicants can certainly reach out to Carolyn after the meeting or to get any clarification about our conditions or kind of next steps. Thank you very much. Congratulations on your first presentation to the planning board. <laughs> oh, thanks. We feel uh, it was a very professional job we did. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn, for helping guide yes. us through it. <laughs> uh, sure. Yes, we, we feel like we know Carolyn pretty well at this point. <laughs> She's been a good okay. help. A very good help. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks again. Okay. Um, before we move on to our next special permit, which or our next uh, application, which sort of started at eight thirty, but we double booked here, um, I'd like to suggest we take a five-minute break. Um, I've been sitting in this chair for two hours, and I just need to stretch my legs and do something else before we come back. Is that all right with folks? That's fine by the applicant. Okay.
get going in just a couple of minutes now as the other George, before we start the meeting, can I just make a raise a possible suggestion for process? About this application? Yeah. Sure, let me- or I should wait? Why don't you wait just till we open up the, the continuation, Alan? Okay. Everybody back. Sam, are you out there? Carolyn, can I ask a process question? I, I think I wasn't a member of the planning board um, for the first part of this hearing. So I think it's appropriate that I recuse myself for the this continuation. Is that correct? Right. So. Um unless you review the record anytime, and this goes for any future meeting that you miss, unless you review the record and certify that you've reviewed the record, you can participate in the conversation and the discussion, but um, your vote wouldn't be tallied. Okay, thank you. I, yep. I did attend the hearing last month, um, but it isn't appropriate for me to vote on this, is what you're saying. Right, not as a, as a member. Um, yeah, you would have had to have been a member at, at that point. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wait, is that true? Even though he attended the meeting, isn't that the same as reviewing the record? I, I um, think. Yeah. Ahead, um, because he wasn't a member at that time, if you were a member, so going forward now as a member, if you miss a meeting, you can go back and review the record. Got that, counselor? Nope. Good. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it is now uh, <coughs> 9903, and the plan, Northampton Planning Board is going to open up a continuation of a site plan review. Uh, from a meeting held on November 12th by New Way Homes, Inc. for a shared driveway at 170 Federal Street, Florence, map ID 23D-6605. <clears throat> so before we get started, I just want to give a little context to what our process and what we'll be going through. And then, um, Alan, I'll ask you certainly to add in if you'd like. Um, we have quite a good crowd here. Um, a lot of folks from the Bay State Village want to make clear that this is a, a continuation hearing and we're picking up where we left off about a month ago. Um, we, we're hoping that we're not going to repeat comments from the last meeting about the concerns for trees, new houses, demolition of houses in the neighborhood. The board continued the hearing in order for the applicant to provide us with more information, detailed information about measures that they could take that might save the trees along the southern property boundary. That information was required to be submitted by a certified arborist. The applicant has done that. The board members have had an opportunity to review that report. And that <coughs> report is up on the city's website and available to the public to see also. Um, so even though the permit application originally was incorrectly checked a special permit, the ordinance only requires a site plan review for Sarah driveway. The site plan is a review about technical <coughs> standards and is not about whether or not a Sarah driveway is allowed or should be permitted. The zoning encourages Sarah driveways to consolidate access points onto a street which makes it safer for all, bikers, walkers, pedestrians, whomever. Um, the site cannot be turned down for a driveway because the board feels that there may be other situations underlying house construction. Um, it's, those aren't appropriate reasons for this. 
We're only looking at those changes, those impacts of the shared driveway and how that is <coughs> laid out according to grade access and landscape modifications. And we depend heavily on the Board of Public Works to review the stormwater plans for this kind of shared driveway on a slope of this nature. Um, we've received quite a few letters from the, from the uh, neighbors, um, very well written, very coherent um, letters, all um, which are also available, have been looked at by the board members. Um, and we appreciate that input. Um, and we're taking that as best as we can. The other issue that has come up um, is, has to do about the ANR issue with the, uh, the houses that are currently under construction on um, Nutting, Nutting Street. So I want to turn this over to Carolyn, who's much more familiar with the ANR situation. Um, then I think any of us board members could speak to. So, uh, Carolyn, would you give us a minute there just about uh, the background on ANRs? Sure. So, um, ANR is um, to refresh the board, mem board members' memories and also uh, members of the public stands for approval not required. What it really means is subdivision approval is not required for the creation of lots. And a subdivision is by state statute, the creation of a new street. So uh, the reason why the regulations are set up to have a process for allowing the creation of lots without going through a subdivision review process is for those parcels that exist on existing streets. So you don't need to create a new street if you're property already has the appropriate amount of frontage um, and width along an existing street, there's no reason to propose and design and develop a new subdivision street. So it's a confusing name. Um, and um, because the planning board still has to look at those plans, you looked at one tonight, um, to confirm um, that in fact, a subdivision isn't necessary to um, allow the reconfiguration of a parcel um, the way it's shown on the plan. And um, the planning board has to endorse an approval not required plan if the plan shows the creation of a property along an existing street that meets the frontage for that zoning district. There's no discretion. It's, it's not a permit that the board can say yes or no to. <clears throat> it's really an administrative review, looking at a property um, reconfiguration and determining that it's not necessary to go through a subdivision development process. So um, there are parcels that are created throughout the city every year in this way. They're not always built upon um, in the same year that those um, lot creations are um, approved. Um, <clears throat> but you, you know, the board sees them fairly regularly. I don't know, anywhere from 20 to 30 a year. Some of them are just for swapping bits of property to other properties. Other ANRs are to create um, typically single family house lots, but sometimes larger. And um, in this case, there were there was an um, approval not required plan submitted showing um, the reconfiguration of two parcels into three parcels, and all three of those new parcels met the frontage requirement. So you were obligated to sign off on that um, A and R, and that's separate from the review that you're conducting tonight, which just which is just about uh, a shared driveway. Thank you, Carolyn. So for those um, members of the public who may have not been to a planning board meeting before, what we'll do is we'll hear from the applicant. Uh, the board will ask a few clarifying questions on the applicant's information. We'll then turn it over to, um, we'll open up the public portion of the meeting because it is a continuation. We never close the public comment period. Um, you'll have an opportunity to speak. I'll give you a few guidelines about 
um, that portion. <clears throat> At that point, um, when we've uh, everyone has had their say, we'll go back to the board for any other clarifying questions for the applicant. We'll close the public hearing. If there's enough information from the applicant at that point, we, the board feels like they've had enough information. We'll close the public hearing and continue and begin our deliberation about the uh, application. Um, if that all that may all get wrapped up tonight, it may not. Um, we will see. So, um, Alan, did you want to say something before we started? Well, I, George, I think you pretty much. Uh, forecasted my concern. I, I think just very, very quickly, the, the communications we received from many of the neighbors raised very legitimate, um, compelling arguments uh, about the neighborhood and what's happening in it. But I think we need to remain focused on, on the particular issues that are before us. And, and most of those issues that were raised aren't, aren't really before the board tonight, in my Thank opinion. Thank you. Okie doke, um, is the applicant here and would they like to um, present? Carolyn, I'm not sure if you've arranged to share the screen or. Mr. Chair, uh, I am Ryan O'Hara. I'm attorney with Bacon Wilson. I'm here representing New Way Homes. Mr. John Hansel, who's the principal of New Way Homes, is here as well. I'll be making the presentation on behalf of New Way. However, given that this is a continued hearing, uh, I, I don't feel that for what we're intending to present in any event in the first instance, we need shared screen. I think that I'm comfortable proceeding just speaking to you. Very good. Thank you. All right. So as I said, you know, my name is Ryan O'Hara. I'm an attorney at Bacon Wilson here in Northampton. Uh, I also am a Northampton resident, live at 76 Pleasant Street for the record. Um, and I'm here on behalf of New Way Homes. And as you've correctly noted, this is a continued hearing on New Way's application for site plan review for a shared driveway project uh, on Federal and Warner Streets in the Bay State Village neighborhood of Florence. And as you've also correctly noted, there's a uh, large turnout from Bay State Village here this evening. And uh, there's been a lot of communications to the board, I'm sure. And I'm sure that they'll have plenty to say in the public comment section. But this is a constrained hearing. The board has a very specific task, and this is simply site plan review of a shared driveway, which as has been discussed, is really a preferred development tactic in the city. So rather than you know, belabor the whole project, I think the thing that makes the most sense from the applicant's perspective in any event is to address the issues that came up at that first hearing, what's been done to address those, and uh, really just kind of quickly run through all the approval criteria that you're to consider tonight. So really my understanding of that first hearing and as has been referenced was concern about trees. And in the original plans for this shared driveway and common lot development around it, the plan called for the removal of a new, numerous of a stand of trees on the south southeasterly uh, boundary of these parcels. And at that first meeting, I know that they was called into question the necessity of the removing those trees. And after the fact, Mr. Hansel worked with an arborist and with his engineers and came to a alternate set of revised plans that included moving the foundation of the house closest to that southern lot line seven feet back. And that's going to allow for keeping all but two trees on that property one of which is a beech tree that's directly in the path of the foundation, which is not part really of a row of these privacy hemlocks, if you want to consider them that way, privacy shade, whatever benefit they're providing, uh, and has, wasn't really discussed at that first meeting. So that tree is still being removed. And the, oh, thank you, Karen, I believe this is the revised plan. So along the, the southern boundary here, you can see these trees marked, and I really appreciate the assist from Carolyn here. That beech tree, that's at the bottom right corner of something indicated proposed house. That is one of the trees being removed. The only other is the further, furthest easternmost hemlock tree. Uh, the reason that one hemlock is going to be removed is because the arborist in reviewing all these trees found that because that one's really, it's got a split to it. And I don't really know how to describe it better than that, but it is the tree that were anything to ever happen in fall 
gives the most potential for, for damage and danger. But other than that, all of these walnuts, hemlocks, the entire stand along the boundary, which formerly would have been removed, is going to be retained. So that's a major change to this plan. It's been done in consultation with professionals. It's been done in consultation with some of Butters. And uh, really, it's, it's what should be lauded on the developer here for working together with this board and the community and preserving these trees after hearing that they were important to people. Uh, so that really is no longer an issue. Now, other than the, the tree issue, there really was not uh, much that I'm aware of from that first meeting. I think a few points worth noting though, is I have heard express some concern uh, about the, the slopes that surround the edge of these properties in Washots. As Mr. Coho, and I apologize if I pronounced your name incorrectly, uh, identified though, those sort of construction concerns are not really what the board is, is to be considering in determining the approval criteria for site plan review for this driveway. It's, it's important to, to recognize that all of these proposed structures at the property would be as of right, as far as dimension use, these are just single family residential homes in a area that is single family residential homes. They're very much in keeping with what already exists in this neighborhood and they, they are not a change in use or the dimensional zoning whatsoever. We're just talking about this common driveway. So then shifting from that to the approval criteria, uh, the first being that the requested use protects adjoining properties against seriously detrimental uses. Well, certainly here where the only use that's coming in is residential, if anything, the use of a shared driveway negates any impact on the neighborhood that could come from the development of these homes as far as traffic concerns, uh, anything like that. A shared driveway, that's almost the exact purpose and why it's favored under city zoning. Uh, similarly, the use of a shared driveway uh, complies with the goal of minimizing curb cuts. It results in only one new curb cut in this street. And in fact, the driveway that's, that's going in here is going in over a pre-existing path or driveway, whatever you want to call it, that's there that goes to the existing structure. So it's not even altering, at least the shared driveway portion, the layout of Warner Street or the amount of curb cuts into it. Uh, similarly, this overall site will function as a harmonious part of the neighborhood. You're simply adding three new residential homes in, which on these lots could have been done as of right with a shared driveway. Uh, similarly, won't in any way overload the city's resources. And it complies with all of the technical performance standards that there are here. Curb cuts are minimized. We're not dealing with a situation where there's a layout of sidewalks, pedestrian ways, bike paths. This is a very simple project that's be, being done in the most, excuse me, the least adversely impactful way. And after the alterations to the tree stand issues with great cooperation with, with neighbors and the city. So you know, beyond that, there's no suggestion of obscene displays or blocking or shading of windows applying here, given the residential use. So really all of these technical performance criteria are clearly met by the project. In good faith, the developer has made changes to mitigate concerns that have been raised to this point. And while I expect that you're going to hear from the public a lot of opposition to this developer and, and his projects in general, I don't think you're going to hear anything that is salient or at all should move the board on the actual limited issues it's deciding now, which is does this proposed shared driveway meet these performance criteria? And it's, it's very clear from the plan and the language of the criteria that it does. I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have Similarly, Mr. Hansel is here and available to answer any more technical questions that this lawyer, not an engineer, can uh, maybe address for y'all. And uh, other than that, I'm happy to answer any questions the board has and uh, I'd rest for the moment. Thank you, Mr. O'Hara. Um, board members, questions for the applicant at this point? Alan, you're muted. Okay, hi. <laughs> um, the arborist recommended various um, tree protection um, 
procedures it, aside from the work that's already been done with the root structure? Uh, is the developer um, intending to follow those recommendations? Can they be incorporated into any decision? I believe right now uh, they're on the book, it's right in the first page of the plans. Everything is going to be as detailed there what has to be done, how it has to be done. And we've already started the procedure of doing some of that work. So I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow your answer. Did you say that you are willing to accept all of the arborist recommendations? Absolutely. That's why, yes. Yeah. So okay. Sorry. Right. I, and and I they are, Mr. Mr. Verson, they, Attorney Verson, they're, they're incorporated into the uh, page one of the plans in the bottom left. It, you'll see a segment that says tree protection recommendations. I believe that that's everything that directly from the arborist's letter is just incorporated right on the plan. So that's now part of the application itself and certainly would Thank be you. acceptable conditions. And actually we've already started on part of that work. Has the applicant and his rep seen the recent update to the Department of Public Works comments on the driveway and the drainage, the stormwater plan? Yes, we have. And, and I believe specifically, although I'm not positive, but are you referencing the DPW's uh, talk about Federal Street and the slope on that side? And the there, yeah, concerns, the, there are that, plus there are other, um, other items regarding the maintenance of the drainage swales uh, uh, and the interventions there. Yes, so there is a stormwater maintenance operation and maintenance plan that has been drafted uh, through council. That has not yet been recorded, but of course, recording that would be a could be, and I believe is required before a building permit issues, but could be a condition of the site plan approval as well. Uh, certainly the, the upshot of what that's intending to address as well, as I understand it, is providing for once these homes are constructed and transferred to individuals, making sure that someone is there who's responsible ultimately for keeping the stormwater infrastructure maintained. And in addition to this agreement, which again, will be of record and therefore really incorporated into anyone's chain of title and buying them. There are additional mechanisms the board could uh, require just such as affirmative covenants placed in any deeds out of the developer that require the maintenance of these structures, just as the properties that where the structures are built are going to be burdened by easements that ensure that they're able to stay there. So, so that's a, a issue where one, there is a, a plan that exists. It just hasn't been recorded yet, but certainly will be uh, prior to the issuance of any building permits. And two, it will be doubly enforced through deed mechanisms that are that are typical in these sort of transfers when you have stormwater protections like that. Thank you. Board members, any other questions? <clears throat> so at this point, we can open it up to the public. Um, and I just want to, again, ask folks to try to limit their comments to three minutes. Um, you know, and we heard a lot at the first meeting. We've seen a lot of correspondence. Um, try to speak to the issue of the shared driveway, because um, that is what's under our purview at this point. Um, and... Uh, We'll have everyone speak once before anyone wants to chime in again. Um, and let's see how we do. All right, and so unfortunately, we're not using the chat feature of Zoom today. So if you'd raise your hand like Mr. Barnes has, either on the uh, participant screen or just vote or just locally, we'll try to do it. So I have Mr. Barnes and I have then Bill Ryan. Mr. Barnes, and if you would just State your, your address too, for the record. That would be great. Yeah, I'm Benjamin Barnes. I live at 117 Riverside Drive. I abut the property on the Southwest. Uh, their, their, their side line for the, the Federal Street property is my back line. I want to address the piece that was left open at the site plan uh, review of the previous public hearing. Um, I've spoken to Mr. Denzel and I've observed his arborist working on the property. And I want to say I appreciate what Mr. Denzel did to determine whether the trees could be saved. 
for those of you who don't know, what uh, he had his arborists come in and they uh, scraped back the soil and, and air blasted around the roots to determine what the roots, where the roots went. Did they come towards the new foundation or did they go down deep into the ground seeking the water table? And apparently hemlocks, these ones go deep. <clears throat> hemlocks often spread out, which was a problem I think we identified initially. So I'm very pleased that the trees could be preserved as Mr. Zenzel has proposed. What I would like to suggest is a refinement, which is the arborist and the piece that I, only piece that I have seen that was available online was the first page and the two pictures says that if the proper, if the foundation is five feet away from the hemlocks, uh, it won't interfere with the roots in a way that will just, will harm the trees, but there'll have to be considerable pruning. And I'd like to return to a comment that I made earlier in the first public hearing, which is, I think the house could be pulled back from Federal Street to, to be, have its front line be the same as the existing house, which has been done. I also think with the zero lot line, the house, the new house could be moved to the north and right on the property line, uh, zero lot line, which would give more, seven or eight feet more for the trees and would probably uh, eliminate the need to, uh, to prune them uh, as severely as the arborist has described. And I assume that further distance of the foundation away from the trees is likely to maintain their health. So I'm happy that the trees are being preserved. Speak My refinement would be, would the developer consider keeping the house number three, new house number three, right on the property line to the north? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. He's resigned. Mr. Ryan. Yes, thank you. My name is Bill Ryan. I live at 129 Warner Street, and thanks for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, it's interesting to hear how this hearing is constrained to just a small uh, aspect of this very important project. Uh, it's interesting that the only opportunity that the public or the planning board has had to have any input on the way this has been designed and laid out is through this narrowly constrained hearing. Um, and so, I am going to ask that, uh, given the review I've done of all the steps that led to this, I'm going to ask that the planning board uh, uh, not take up this decision, and instead that a group from the city, all the city officials development involved in development, look at this before anything is granted, and uh, and try and ascertain how this came before you, with so little input from you. It was very interesting to listen to your previous discussion of a very small project and the amount of time that you talked about how all the little details of the way it would be done and yet you've spent not nearly that much time on this whole project. Because what I found was that there's been a piecemeal permitting process that the developer has skillfully navigated to ensure that there was no meaningful input about its makeup from your board or the public and no awareness of the full extent of the project by you or the, prod or the public until this driveway permit approval was laid before you as a fait accompli for you to approve according to its satisfaction of some technical specifications. That's what's happened. Uh, I found that along the way, there was a zoning permit, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, as I found that along the way, there was a zoning permit issued to the developer in June before you authorize the initial a &R for any new lots. These are the kind of irregularities that I'm finding. That vague zoning permit was for an application for a so-called additional lot. The location of that lot on the 170 Federal Street property was not specified and no information was provided about what would be built and yet a zoning permit was issued. I found that other than that initial vague zoning permit, the building department cannot provide me with a zoning permit for the new house now being built on lot two of the plan. Yet a building permit was issued for that house and this house is entirely out of scale with the neighborhood in a manner that seemingly to all of us neighbors and anyone else I've talked to is in violation of the zoning code for our URB district. And on that very same day that the building permit was issued, the developer submitted the site plan application for this shared driveway that he had been holding until he got the building permit. But knowing that getting the bit that uh, applying for the shared driveway would trigger public review, 
but he was already sure that he could start building the house, which he has done with great speed. Uh, and on that site plan was a third new lot and a proposed house that you nor the public had ever seen before. And that you're now being asked to endorse that new lot and another ma potentially massive house to be built on it within this application for a shared driveway. So this constrained shared driveway application is now being expanded to include approval of that new lot and new house on it without any consideration of the way the whole uh, uh, development is being laid out from you at any point in time. Now, someone with authority needs to, oh, uh, and now you're being asked to endorse that new lot. If you do, we think there's a strong likelihood the developer will demolish the existing original house on the property to achieve a subdivision of monolithic houses of the same design in our neighborhood. Someone with authority needs to investigate how this process has been allowed to proceed to this point and ascertain what can be done to bring it under control. So I'm requesting that a full and public review of this entire project by the planning board, the zoning board, the city council, and the mayor's office, as well as any other government agencies involved in the development be carried out and then approval of the driveway permit before you be You know who he is, right? Until this yeah. is done. Liz, right up at the Mr. blue house on the corner. Uh, Mr. Jarvis. Yes. Old ladies. Can you hear us, Mr. Jarvis? <laughs> thank you. Mr. Ryan, thank you very much. And, and we did all, uh, we're in receipt of your detailed letter, which pretty much laid out your, um, the same um, issues you brought forward to us tonight. Appreciate that. Other comments from the public? Mr. Paradise. Thank and you, then Ms. Mr. Chairman. I'm Theodore Paradise. I uh, live at 94 Crescent Street in, in Northampton. Um, and I'm here uh, to, to note that uh, uh, Mr. Hansel built a home right next to, to my home uh, at 181 Round Hill uh, on land that actually used to be part of, of the grounds of this house. Um, and he was an incredibly responsible builder um, the design is uh, uh, in scale with, with the neighborhood, certainly materials are top rates. Um, and he did a great job listening to neighbors about details down to even the color of the home. Now you guys have done a wonderful job here tonight uh, at the board reminding everyone that the scope of what you're looking at is the driveway. And that's important, obviously there are rules and regs and people who buy property and fee simple have uh, the ability to do certain things. And it's not for everyone to be able to block those things if they simply don't like them. There's, there's limited review uh, of, of certain uh, steps that are taken with construction. And, and I applaud the board for uh, limiting the discussion appropriately um, as you should. But uh, I would note that my experience with this builder was that even though there were several people in this neighborhood who just didn't want to see a new house, um, who were in favor of urban density but didn't want urban density next to them, who liked uh, you know new housing for for families but not next to them, or any sort of visual change, um, they had to even agree at the end when when Mr. Hansel was done that the home was beautiful, and and a, a wonderful addition to the neighborhood, um, and so I'm here just to offer comments. Uh, from my experience of, of being uh, right next to um, uh, a property that, that Mr. Hansel constructed, uh, that is very responsible builder and really added uh, construction that, that uh, is an addition to the city um, and not the product of some nefarious, skillful navigation of, of permits to try to undermine uh, the building uh, regs and, and permit process. Um, that's certainly not what John has been after. He went the extra mile to accommodate things he could have done as the owner of a fee simple lot and simply chose to try to make people happy um, at his own time and expense. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paradise. And before we go on to Ms. Balance, I just want to remind um, folks, we have a big crowd here tonight. It's getting late. Try to hold your comments to three minutes and try to talk to issues that are germane to the driveway. So I have Ms. Balance, anyone after her? I've had my hand up for a while. Okay, Mr. Mirabella, Reyes we'll get Lazaro. you next. Reyes Lazaro. All right, Jace, okay, we'll get to you two after Balance. Ms. Balance, please. Did 
Did you go away, Miss Balance? Now I'm unmuted. Balance. Ah, there you go. I, I was I was happy to hear that Mr. Paradise is satisfied with living next door to one of Mr. Hansel's houses. I'm glad that Mr. Hansel has his character references all lined up, but we are not talking about a situation like Mr. Paradise saw of putting one house on one lot. We are seeing four houses on one lot. And I think Mr. Paradise might have thought twice if that was the situation in his neighborhood. I want to thank also Carolyn Mish for her patience this week and her extremely helpful answers to our many questions. Now I wanna talk about the driveway. In a memo from the city engineer earlier today, it seemed to me that he was recommending a professional geotechnical evaluation to be done in order to ensure the integrity of that slope on Federal Street before any digging begins on a third new house, that house that requires this shared driveway. The original house on that site was built in the 1800s. Its foundation, I think we can surmise, was hand dug, not dug out by heavy equipment. Heavy equipment could impair that slope. Um, and according to Mr. Valida, the requirement of a geophysical evaluation falls under the purview of the planning board, not the DPW. I see that the engineer is here tonight and I would ask him to correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that you must decide, if you, if you must decide this matter tonight, you must deny the permit because the DPW has found there are unresolved safety issues. Whether the permit is approved or denied or postponed, I too request a full and public review of this whole project with a goal of correcting the multiple permit process weaknesses and irregularities that this project has exposed. I yield. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, uh, and I would like to hear from the engineer if he wants to say something. Before we'll we're done. we'll hold off on that a little bit until we speak to the other people. Okay, Ms. Balance, we'll take questions um, from those expert witnesses later on. Mr. Mirabello. Yes, uh, I live on 14 Landy Avenue, uh, up the street from Federal Street, and. I know that a lot of these zoning laws and, and boundaries from houses, how far away from the property lines and everything really go back to the fact that there was a lot of fires in different neighborhoods. I think of the big Chelsea fire in Chelsea, Mass a few years ago. My question is actually this, has the fire department seen and review this? Because they may have concerns about getting their fire trucks to the back houses going up that driveway and the possibility of stuff blocking that driveway from them getting into a house with an ambulance or a fire truck. And, and that's a major concern for me because, you know, I, I hate to see stuff like this happening and people, you know, possibility of losing their lives if they can't get rescued. Thank you very much, Mr. Mirabella. We'll be sure to check in with staff on the fire department public safety's role on a shared driveway before we end the meeting. Uh, is it uh, Ms. Lazaro? Yes, thank you very much. And I apologize for being invisible. I don't like it, but the computer is not letting me open the camera. Sorry, I think it's That's coming up. I would like to you to be able to see me, but I'm not managing to. Anyways, I'll be brief. Um, I also support the request for a moratorium on all permits for the project. Why? Centrally for one objection that goes to the core of what has of the premise of the meeting. We have been told repeatedly that we can only talk about the driveway. This in a community that has not been given information or whose concerns have not been heard is tantamount can't amount to silencing. Secondly, probably your decision of a driveway has consequences. If not, correct me. Please correct me. But I have a feeling that it is not a small decision. 
that it may have impact on future requests on, on what is possible or is not possible. If I am wrong, correct me. But I want to question deeply this premise that we can only talk about the driveway. Finally, again, I think this project has to be looked at holistically and with a larger frame because it is a large project of large impact. And I, I think the committee needs to have all the information at hand. Um, Mr. Hansel. You, Ms. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're just breaking up a little bit. Ms. Sorry, we can hear sorry. you now, but you're breaking up. The other day I had a conversation, very, very kind conversation with Mr. Hansel, where he informed me that he's planning on building on the house currently on 170 Federal. And I really appreciated his candor and his directness. Now I spoke to somebody else in your committee and they told me that no, the house is being remodeled. So to finish, because I think that your piecemeal decisions may have larger impact, I think you should know the whole plan. This is a very big consequential decision, whether there are three houses or four, one on a fragile hill. You should have that information. That's it. Basically, you know, piecemeal um, is a way of silencing and piecemeal has larger impact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I live on 172 Federal Street, right across from the project. Thanks. Thanks. Anyone else in the public? Ah, Mr. Gieselin. Hi, I'm Alex Gieselin. I live at 164 Riverside Drive. And as somebody who advocated for the uh, reduction of dimensional requirements uh, many years ago, uh, as part of the conversation about infill, uh, I feel a certain amount of responsibility for lack of foresight that uh, a project of this size really needs some sort of review. And I'd like to see uh, perhaps this triggering a, a, a conversation in the planning department and, and the city at large uh, about uh, some sort of review, because this is really the uh, value of housing in North Hampton has got to the point where almost any house uh, can be uh, taken down to uh, maximize the amount of housing in a in a, in a small area. And while I don't necessarily uh, just, you know, oppose that at all, I, around the corner on Hinkley Street, uh, Jonathan Wright built uh, a very responsible uh, project uh, that uh, you know, set kind of a standard. Uh, but there aren't a, a lot of people like Jonathan and uh, we've sort of, the city has sort of monetized neighborhoods in here and uh, the value uh, that uh, one person puts in the bank really comes out of the long-term interests or may come out of the long-term interests of the city. My only point is that I think that it went, that the scale that this, uh, that this concentration of development in a small area really needs uh, another layer of review or needs some layer of review. Thank you. Thank you. Ben W. Hi, my name is Ben Weiss. I live at 111 Riverside Drive. And I was at the previous meeting. Uh, our house is on the south side next to Benjamin Barnes. And I think we're one of the houses that's the most affected by the fourth house that's being built. And just something that I was thinking about as the meeting was starting and the process uh, that people are talking about that I'm a little bit confused by is that I'm not sure that I totally understand. I'm also, I'm also watching the Patriots game. I'm not sure that I totally understand <laughs> the idea that um, only the driveways at discussion because in the meeting a month ago, everybody, you know, we came, we talked about the concerns about the trees, which were not related at all to the shared driveway. Uh, and Mr. Hansel, to his credit, 
was responsive, but that too was a constrained discussion as the attorney you know, outlined. Uh, and yet that discussion, it was the op only opportunity to talk about the project. We brought up the concern about the trees. Mr. Hansel you know, thought about it and then did the right thing, which I really appreciate. So I just don't, I don't know, I don't, it seems like this actually is an opportunity to talk about this project and that people are using it that way. And so I, I, I don't buy that, um, that that's not the case. In terms of the trees, I really appreciate what Mr. Hansel did. I think it was an effort to listen to people. Uh, and so I applaud him for doing that. It's gonna make a big difference if he puts in the fourth house. The only thing that I would say, and I just think this might speak to why, in addition to the type of projects that are happening with Mr. Theodore's Paradise's experience uh, accepted, I think part of what people are responding to, so for instance, Mr. Hansel met with me for an hour to talk about this project before last month's meeting. And he was real clear with me that it was physically impossible for him to build the fourth home without removing all the trees. I asked, could you move it closer to Cindy Jones's home? He said, no, it's physically impossible. It's, I cannot do it. And then lo and behold, he thinks that he may not be able to do it and all of a sudden it's totally fine. So I, I think part of it is a stylistic thing where if you're gonna be in a community, you should deal honestly and openly with the people you're dealing with. And I think when people feel like they're not being spoken to respectfully and honestly, it brings up such a strong response. So that's, that's my comment for the night. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Any other members of the public? I may not. Suman and then Ms. Komidar. Why don't you go first, Ms. Suman? Just unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, I was trying to do it. And I, I finally got it. I've been on Zoom before and I just. No well, problem. Um, I live at uh, 57 Hinckley Street. Um, I moved here in 1999. Um, our house is probably one of the older houses in the Bay State area. It was like 1840. Um, we've got boulders for our basement. But anyway, the point I'm getting, at, we, we moved here, um, two family house, thank, you know, and so that enabled us financially to purchase a home. Um, back then, you know, it was still high, but we were able to do it. Um, and I, appreciate this community because it is, um, you know, a very open and, you know, friendly community. Um, the, 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 the houses are built on lots that um, give space, even though on one side of our house, you know, the house is pretty close, but almost as close as uh, the Hansel house is down there. But um, that, um, but it just gives us a feeling of living in the city, but still yet being in the country, quote unquote. And um, when I saw these houses going up, you know, and then thinking, oh my goodness, you know, that's, that's pretty congested down there. And, um, you know, I could see maybe one or two houses going in on that lot, but not four. And now they want to build up on, um, Warner Street, just down the street from us at the corner of Warner and Hinckley, which I'm going to, you're going to talk about later. And they want to put up three houses there. And it's almost like, well, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, I like my place. I, it, the, 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 the streets are con constructed in the manner where there are woods in the back, you know, someone was going to come in one time and put houses down in the center, you know, where there are swamps and our Place, but thank God my neighbor, um, Doug, you know, purchased that along with another neighbor and blocked that possibility. Um, but anyway, I just want to say just the, the concentration is what bothers me. And, um, you know, the desire to sell these houses for unbelievable cost, you know, where, what community are you from, Mr. Hansel? Uh, Ms. Suman, we'll only take questions kind of Okay, the board, all right, okay, okay. Yeah. thank you. That's yeah. fine, sure. no problem. 
All right. But that's why I just, you know, like this community. Bye. Good. Thank you very much. And again, just a reminder, I know this developer is doing other projects around the town and in the neighborhood, but, you know, unfortunately, we're not um, apprised of those situations. They're not part of today's, uh, this evening's discussion. Okay, I think we have Ms. Komidar. Hi, my name is Catherine Komidar. Thanks for listening. I live at 129 Warner Street. Um, and I'd also like to ask the board to just consider delaying their decision on this matter this evening. There's an awful lot of unanswered questions, um, pr pretty serious questions, it seems to me about this whole process and how it's come about with lack of input from the public. And um, I, I feel like it's, it's worth taking the time, it's worth taking the board's time to delay the decision a little bit. Um, the, the ramifications of this project are, are gonna have lasting and devastating effects on some people's lives here. And um, it also seems to me, um, what happens here with our process um, has the potential to set a precedent for how the unfolding of infill is going to go on in the future and what our city is going to be like as a result of that and these decisions and and also as kind of a marker for how we are or we aren't taking care of our earth with the way that we're building here so i also just respectfully ask that you um, consider taking the extra time to getting to the bottom of some of these questions before making your decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think Mr. Jarvis has been waiting for a while. Are you with us? Yep. I, am, I am, can you hear me? Hear you fine, yep. Great, um, good evening everyone. My name is Mark Jarvis. I live at 84 Warner Street. Um, uh, Mr. Ryan, thank you for starting the ball rolling on a discussion, which is very, very important. I can remember some years ago attending a meeting at the high school where a presentation was given. I think it may have been by you, Carolyn, I'm not sure. Uh, but the presentation was the public hearing for the changing of zoning that would allow this infill to take place. And at that time, I brought up the idea that uh, developers are simply gonna swoop in, demolish perfectly good houses and cram the lots filled with, uh, you know, with, uh, with, with oversized houses that don't really fit in with the, uh, with the neighborhood and the local surroundings. And I was told at that time that nobody at the city envisaged such a thing happening. Um, well, I assume that they do now envisage these things happening. What was particularly interesting to me about that presentation was that a number of examples were held up in that presentation to show what couldn't happen with the current zoning and, uh, and what might be allowed if the zoning were changed. And as soon as the zoning was changed, all of those building projects you know, miraculously uh, became real. So, you know, excuse me if I seem a little skeptical, excuse me if I seem a little paranoid, but it just seems to me that someone somewhere uh, is working for the benefit of the, uh, the developers and contractors rather than for the benefit of the, uh, of the neighborhoods and the citizens of uh, Northampton. And it's for that very reason that I support all the ideas that we should just slow this down a little bit and have a full review of this process because frankly, it just smells a bit funny to me. Thank you, Mr. Jarvis. Um, I see Joyce and then Ms. Walter. Just unmute yourself, Joyce. Hello, my name is Joyce Rosenfeld and I live at 15 Warner Street. I've lived here for uh, close to 16 and a half years. One of the joys of moving into this neighborhood was <clears throat> the sense of the scale of it. It was a human scaled neighborhood. Um, I recently spent as much as I could afford to renovate my house within its footprint. And one of the priorities of my renovation was to put in a bank of windows in the front of the house 
so that I could take advantage of seeing the sky, uh, the trees um, from my kitchen. Um, now that uh, these houses are going up across the street from me on Warner Street, uh, from my place in the kitchen where I spend a lot of time, I can no longer see the sky. The scale of these uh, um, edifices is totally out of balance with this neighborhood. Um, and I don't understand how it could happen. I don't know how many of the board have been by to see what this project looks like, but even though it may be within the letter of the law, uh, it's not within the letter of the spirit of this neighborhood. And I certainly propose that we delay any decision about this driveway, which is the artery that makes this whole thing uh, possible because there's been no other way to discuss it. I even, when there was first a bulldozer outside, came out to speak to whoever it was driving uh, the truck to ask what was going on. And I was told quite curtly, there might be two houses there. I was never uh, given the courtesy of an introduction. It turned out it was uh, Mr. Hanzo. Um, so I think the fact that the neighbors have not been given the courtesy, whether they had to be or not, uh, to know what was going on uh, is an issue. And certainly I recommend that you come by and see what this project looks like at the, on Warner Street uh, at Federal. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we'll turn it over to Rue Walther. Rue, unmute yourself. I should know better. I teach school all day this way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I live at 16 Warner Street and I live right next door to the project. I am the abutter. Other people might consider themselves abutting. I am the abutter. And you haven't heard from me because I couldn't make the last meeting because the scope of this project is so huge and I teach school virtually because my schools are closed, that I had to go to my boyfriend's house way out of town because I haven't been able to work. My kids go, what's that noise? It's so noisy. I know that's not the problem, but this is how huge this scale is. One day I came home and there was a driveway. I am here to tell you that the driveway, if you go by, is it's to my property line, that's not a problem, but it is to my property line. And when I moved into my house about 14 years ago, I was looking at extending my house off the front. And at the time it was prior to the infill law, which I really wasn't aware of, but that's not, neither here nor there. I was told that I would only really be able to go the footprint of my front porch because of the rule of feet between my property and the next property. And I understood that. I moved here from East Nashville in Tennessee and we had very strict laws and they were very appreciated in my neighborhood. But what bothers me, Mr. Hansel, is that along with, I've had situations the same as Joyce. You were very nice the other day when I was asking you about leaving that rope there so I could at least not have to repay someone to measure my property line when I'm putting up my fence that I'm gonna have to put up so that my driveway and my neighbor's driveway are not like the only thing that I have. So that will be an expense that I will now have to incur, but it would not even be safe for me. I have a vision of somebody driving up my yard. They put a driveway in. I don't know whether I missed it. I don't know whether I didn't get a notice or maybe we don't have to anymore. But the gentleman who spoke to the fact that he was in on that infill and said, maybe I didn't think, I think we all need to go up 20,000 feet and look down and think about what the implications are of what we're going to do 
and not just saying, oh, well, everyone in Northampton is nice. No one will do anything wrong. Mr. Hansel was asked by my boyfriend near the early time in the project. He went out and asked him a question. Hey, can you tell me what's going on? Mr. Hansel looked at him and walked away. Early on in the project, I asked people that were doing work out there nicely. Hey, you know, what's going on? Is it one house? Is it two? Oh, we just work here. Basically, we got the feeling, and Mr. Hansel, this may not be so, but the feeling was that people were kind of not allowed to talk about what was going on. And so I'm reiterating what a lot of neighbors said, but I truly feel that it's really important before this happens anywhere else. Because I, am, I do have a subdivision next to me, call it what you want. And I chose this street because it wasn't a subdivision. I wanted this. And it'll happen up the street more. And flock, you know, we're talking about how we're going to do zoning. I was in. The, I came for the early part of the meeting. It was all about all the zoning downtown and down in downtown Florence and walkability. Well, let's think about our neighborhoods in Bay State. Bay State's not the stepchild. We're part of Florence. We're part of Northampton. Whatever we're part of, and we are probably the area where people can afford to move into the most. And so this is like our feeder area. And if we continue like this, there's not going to, Bay State's going to lose its, it will lose its charm. And Mr. Hansel, I'd also, I, I would like to actually tell you that if you really have never seen what that hill, I actually scrolled through my phone for like an hour trying to find the pictures that I took and sent to my children in college and a little older a couple of years ago when the hill basically collapsed. I drove home, it was like a landslide. And I took pictures and sent them to my kids and said, I worry for Cindy that this house could slide down the hill. So it's, people aren't just saying this for, you know, oh, it could, that hill has collapsed. And I'm worried about a second house on that hill, creating an impact that will be very dangerous, not just not look good. So. You know, and, and I again think that we really need to reevaluate what's going on. And it's really based on the fact that we are not feeling like we're being told the truth. And I'm going to leave it at that. But I Thank agree with everything. That Thank you very much. And we'll talk a little bit later on about the DPW's um, comment on the slope. But thank you for bringing that up again. All right. May I speak? Any other any other neighbors? Yep. Yep. Okay, There's... I'm looking. Deborah. Yep. Thank you. My name is Deborah Berkovitz. I live at 41 Warner Street. I want to thank the planning board for all of your service to the community. Um, you know, a couple things come to mind. One is that we're, you know, we're talking about trees in a driveway because that's the only chance that we have to talk about anything but um i want to say that i work for the state and my experience working for the state is that people work in silos and so we often don't know what's happening from place to place and i think part of what you're hearing from neighbors is that there are so many questions about how this project has progressed without enough transparency and information shared uh, that I think maybe people haven't been talking to each other and that's part of the reason why I'm also asking for a pause. The other thing that happens at the state and I assume in the city also is that people pass off responsibility to other departments. My only purview is a driveway. That's all I can talk about. But if that's all that you can talk about, where can we talk about the other issues? In fact, this hearing right now is the only thing standing between where we are right now and two more houses that are two to three times the size of the neighboring houses. Um, I want to talk about earlier on in the meeting, uh, there was discussion about the stormwater, the, the water containment system, which you know I know I voiced concerns about. We have tremendous water issues. We have an underwater stream right by that property. Um, and so we're told that Mr. Hansel is going to be building a, you know, a properly specced system to contain the water. But what I want to say is that the footings for the house that were the house that's built closest to this uh, shared driveway were poured in a deluge, which is going to put the concrete for that building potentially in jeopardy in the future. 
and that the driveway that was laid next to Rue's house was laid without a stone crushed underlayment. Both of those things are worrisome enough, uh, as well as a, a, a comment that Mr. Hensel made in the last meeting that suggested, well, that's not my problem. That's, that's the problem of the next owners. So I have really serious concerns about, um, frankly, you know, trusting the construction here. And, um, you know, I'm okay, maybe I'm a little, you know, I don't know, having somebody hire their own geotechnical engineer, having somebody hire their own arborist is a little questionable. I would say I'd love to see the city when these kinds of things happen, have the developer pay for them, um, but have a neutral party, uh, you know, actually take care of it. And, um, and, oh, there are so many things that I could say about this, but uh, I guess my other question really is about the zoning code requirements. Um, maybe I'm not reading them properly, but it does seem that there, that there are codes around scaling and um, it is impossible to see that these projects would have been consistent and would not have been able to be anticipated. I'm happy to share with the board pictures of Mr. Hansel's other properties in town. It's the same house being constructed over and over again. Uh, you know, we knew what they would look like. We knew what they would look like on the highest hill in Bay State. You know, it's the most prominent lot in Bay State that, that these houses are being built in, built on. Um, and so why wasn't anybody asking these questions? And so I'm really asking that we put a pause because there are too many questions. There is too much citizen concern and there are no mechanisms in place for this to have something of this unprecedented scale to have occurred with without anything besides looking at a few trees and a, and a shared driveway. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, I see a couple of more and then we'll be wrapping up, I think. I have uh, Mary McKittrick and then Tom Bine. Mary? Uh, thanks for this limited opportunity to speak. I wanted to echo what others have said that the shared driveway permit request should not be approved until there's an, a genuine full public review of this project and our infill regulations need to be reviewed so that we're actually addressing problems of affordable housing, which these houses are not. I'm at uh, 134 Riverside, which we bought 24 years ago. It was literally the only two-story house in Northampton that we could afford. And um, where the property values keep going up, which is not something that I think is a good thing. Um, and the neighborhood used to be one of modestly priced homes, but um, projects like this are just driving prices up and up and doing nothing to address the real problem of affordable housing. And what's happening here is just creating unchecked opportunities for vulture capitalists, which is a problem that has been absolutely rampant in real estate development nationwide and to which Northampton is extremely vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Bine? Uh, yes, thank you. Oh. Oh, no, I you're... think you just muted yourself, Mr. Bine. Keep trying. How's that? There you go. go okay. Ahead. All right. Okay. Um, I you, just want... Your yeah. address, please. Oh, yes. 21 Warner Street. Um, I just wanted to echo um, Mary McKittrick's comments about affordability. Um, and there was some missing impressions that were told before by the builder uh, that we just don't want any change. We just don't like houses going up. No, that's not the case at all. Um, I think it's, uh, I would, I'm in favor of, con I would not be opposed to construction on that site. I was not opposed to construction, but I, it, what happened to affordability, which was one of the city's goals. And if anything that's going on here, it's taking a property 
that the original house, which was affordable, making it unaffordable and adding three more unaffordable houses. Um, so it's decreasing the stock of affordable housing uh, and increasing uh, expensive housing. Um, and that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, well, hearing no other new information, um, I think we'll turn it over to the planning board for a little bit and make sure that uh, we have our questions answered before we think about closing the public hearing um, and if that's appropriate. Um, there's been quite a number of issues raised here. Um, I don't know if planning board members have any other questions for the applicant or items of discussion you wanna talk to Carolyn about for some background information. George, I have a question about the um, who the owner of the stormwater system is going to be. Um, it looks like it was written that the it's going to convey with 170 Federal Street, and I'm just curious how that works with a shared driveway that's on uh, a different property. So, are there easements for the 170 Federal Street owner to maintain the, the driveway for the other two houses? How is that going to work? I think that's a question for the applicant or his lawyer. Yeah, Mr. Tate, I, I, I believe I addressed that earlier, but I'm happy to you know, reiterate that it's done basically twofold, right? You have this agreement for the operation of it that's going to be of record and incorporated into any chain of title for any owner of any of the four parcels, well, the three that involve the shared driveway that are involved here. As far as who is actually gonna hold title to the real estate and the, uh, drainage infrastructure, that will be the parcel they're located on. That parcel will be burdened by an easement in favor of the other parcels here. Uh, that easement will give those parcels the right to go on and maintain it if for whatever reason the person whose property it's on is failing to do so. The person whose property it's on will have no right to prevent the others from coming and doing that. And uh, Really, that's that's the way the ownership of the, the drainage is handled and that the, the fee simple. So basically what we think of as owning the, the land and the thing itself is that will be the, the land on which it's located. But again, built into because of one, this common scheme development two the agreement that's going to be a record in three actual languages that's going to be put in these deeds. Every owner of the adjacent properties will have the, the right and you know, arguably obligation to go in and maintain the stormwater drainage. So should there be like a homeowners association that's between the three lots that's responsible for the, for the maintenance of the stormwater system? I only ask because the stormwater maintenance agreement is written, um, only specifies 170 Federal Street as the uh, location. So I was a little confused. Yeah, so I, I, I believe that, and I'm not the one that drafted the agreement, so I apologize, I'm not intimately familiar with every term of it, but my understanding is that that's because that's where the infrastructure is in fact located. But again, each, each one of these properties can, and if the board desires, will be or, ordered to have the obligation to, to maintain that. These are things that can be built into the deeds for anyone taking title, uh, but primarily, of course, responsibility is going to fall on the owner of the property on whose land these drainage infrastructures are. Um, I could speak to that. The, the act that the ordinance actually requires, especially for the driveway, that maintenance is, um, is assigned to all the property owners that have access to the driveway. And because the drainage infrastructure is a piece of that um, driveway, all the um, Every uh, parcels will have to um, have shared responsibility. We would review that language before um, certificate of occupancies are issued for any of those. That's pretty standard um, language. And it, I would certainly encourage you, even though the ordinance says that, it probably makes sense to clarify in conditions that um, that be um, reviewed by um, the city 
prior to recording to make sure that um, it's written in the right way. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Still ask a question? Yes, but Deborah, if you would hold off for a little bit till we just get our uh, turn, but we'll come back to you. Any other questions for the board? Thanks for that one, Chris. Carolyn, can you speak about the um, um, <clears throat> fire department um, and safe access up that shared driveway for um, you know emergency services? But I know one of the uh, other things that tend to come up in tandem with that are uh, trash removal, snow <laughs> removal, other kind of more major vehicles that need to come in and out. So can you address that point? And, and if it's gone through review, if it needs to go through review uh, by the fire department or otherwise to ensure that there's safe access there? Yeah, um, typically the fire department does not provide, does not bring apparatus up driveways like this. Um, they, they stay on the street, that's where the hydrants are. So that's not an issue. There might, um, the grades of the driveway um, meet the standards for other emergency access. So if an ambulance had to um, get um, up the driveway, that actually is um, one of the reasons why we have a maximum um, um, grade um, requirement in the zoning is to ensure that there's adequate uh, provision for emergency services. Um, uh, let's see, oh, in terms of private trash removal, I mean, that that's sort of the purview of um, the haulers. I mean, I think they'd probably go to the street. Um, that's what's typically done if people aren't taking their own refu you know, their own garbage themselves to the transfer station, they hire out, you know, um, to whoever um, they choose. There, <clears throat> there has been an issue, an ongoing issue about the slope on the other side of Federal Street. And even though it appears like the driveway will not impact on that slope over there. Um, certainly giving up, um, permitting the driveway provides access to a foundation and the house. So the DPW did address that um, in their comments to the applicant. Um, and they did recommend that prior to construction that the applicant engages the service of a geotechnical engineer, but it's just a, a suggestion. So to protect the applicant's own um, situation. Certainly the applicant will be responsible for any damage that happens to that slope. Um, the planning board doesn't really have purview, I don't believe, to um, make that a condition for anything here tonight. Um, the applicant will be responsible for any damage that happens there. Yeah, and, and just on that point, uh, if, if I may, on behalf of Mr. Hansel, uh, certainly it, I agree with your take that that's beyond the purview of site plan review, uh, but just to reassure those who have, who have raised that issue, you know, that, that slope is something that's been accounted for in the design here. Uh, you can see on the plans, the demarcated uh, erosion control measures and the plans are very specific that the limitation of work, of any work performed, is going to be at least 10 feet away from even the, the erosion control measures. So this is something that's been accounted for in the planning in Mr. Hansel's long experience building homes. That's never, that's been more than sufficient distance to avoid disruption of existing earth. And as you've just kind of summarized, uh, nobody perhaps has more of a vested interest in preventing any sort of massive failure of this land or erosion than the developer himself. And he, aside from accounting for it in the plans in actually constructing this thing has every interest in the world in ensuring that nothing like that happens. So even though the board can't, it's our position, order such a condition, it's something that's being thoughtfully considered and will continue to do so throughout the, the construction process if this is approved. Thank George, you. I have a question. Go ahead, Al. Um, just to clarify, looking at the plan, access on lot one to the garage is 
it is up the westerly boundary line of that property. Is that right? There's no driveway shown, but and I don't recall one from being out there. But how how do they get access to their garage? Well, the abutter, Ms. Walther, did let us know that a driveway has been built on that side of the lot. Um, that's, you know, again, that's an A&R lot that's approved and not part right. of our purview. But uh, I don't think any of those outbuildings are foreseen as being used as garages, well, per se. The, the um, the one I the, the, yeah, the one in the back corner says, if I, it's in such tiny printing, but I think it says proposed garage. So that the, does, the app, does the applicant want to speak to that? Yeah, it, well, correct. It is a garage, but it's there is a driveway going off Warner Street directly into it. Which we was talking about was next to her property. So it doesn't go directly up Warner Street. It's perpendicular to Warner Street. Well, it goes off Warner Street. Okay, so it goes up the as as the neighbor said. As I, it's not shown on the plan, but um, yeah, I, I, the plan I had here shows it all. Well, okay, I, I Ellen, I think there's a newer plan that shows it. I think the first plan that we saw that the board saw last month didn't show it, and there's a newer one on the website that does. That is correct. She oh, wanted a right. revised plan. I have. Yeah, I have that one also. I'm sorry. I, I was looking at the first one. Okay, so that answers my question. To be clear, that is not the driveway we're talking about tonight anyway. It's a separate Absolutely not. No, I understand that. Can I ask okay. one clarifying um, question? George, this is Chris Tate. Yep, go right ahead. Carolyn, is there would there be anything stopping the developer from uh, building on this on the lot that everyone's worried about if he had direct access from <clears throat> what is it Federal Street? If he if he built a driveway that went into like a uh, basement garage, I know this is I. I know this is the bad hillside and everything, but would we even be here tonight if if that was the plan? Um, if he could build a driveway that um, did not exceed the uh, maximum grade require um, allowances in the zoning, then yes. So if yes, if there were a way to um, engineer a sort of a you know a drive under garage with a house on top, then that would be by right. Um, there would be. Um, it would just be someone file, like filing for a single family house and a driveway permit. They would go to DPW for curb cut um, permit review and we look at the grades and yeah. So the only reason that's um, before you is because they're trying to consolidate the driveways into one on the side of the property. Okay, good. Well, let's go back to the public for a quick minute. Deborah, new information, I hope, or a new yes. comment or yeah. Yes, thank you for for asking. And I think Rue had something to ask afterwards. So I have three questions. Um, what city department is going to monitor the drainage um, system? Uh, because Nutting Street is literally downstream. We're talking about rivers that happen there. And as a homeowner, I often find it difficult to manage just maintaining my gutters. So, uh, so I'd like to know um, in the event, the very likely event that a homeowner does not in fact uh, do this, is the city gonna on some regular basis be monitoring uh, the water status um, of that area? So that's one question. Um, I'd also like to know if the drainage system that was the containment system that was designed was designed um, with a look, you know, a 10 year, 15, 20 year look with climate change because we're having so much more water. And so it seems like if something's being built now with the city plans going out, that the containment system should be accommodating 
uh, the fact that there's going to be a lot more water um, coming in. And I would ask the same thing about this, the stability of the bank. Um, is it being, um, is it being considered both in terms of additional saturation of ground and also if Mr. Hansel proceeds to build another uh, 2,500 square foot house or whatever on the existing house site, um, what is that going to do to the stability of the bank? You know, we're, we're, it seems like we keep getting things in bits. So if there's approval of the bank stability based on what there is now and then he is able to proceed and take that house down and build a much bigger one is there going to need to be an additional assessment of the site stability at that point and and there's just one point of clarification is that the driveway that uh, Mr. Verson was asking about in question is the one that was laid with no underlayment just on the dirt which leads to failure. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, I, do you want me to what, answer those what, questions? What driveway is she talking about that has no underlayment? I, I'm confused on this one. I believe the driveway in question is the one next to Miss Walters on the west side, the lot number one. Pure that not was laid. We'll phrase this properly. Uh, no, the driveway was put with, there's plenty of under base. We brought in the right material. The, my escalator is nothing but an escalant, one of the best jobs I've seen over there. So there's plenty there of base coat. So I have no idea. Which there's dirt. Street. There's dirt under. I, I, watch, I, would, I, would, I, would, okay. I would suggest we don't, I would suggest we don't go down the rabbit hole on this issue. It doesn't really matter for today's discussion what it is. Let's just leave it and, and not go down this wow. rabbit hole. No, we really don't care. We have two other questions from uh, the public. One, Carolyn, unless John, you want to answer that. Uh, but there's hard pack underneath the driveway. All the hard pack was brought in. And then on top of that, we put a base coat so we'd have something for the winter. So it wouldn't be all, we could plow it and yep. keep it clean. Yep. And Carolyn, it, the, per, the, the no first base. question. Yeah, I think we understand the, the driveway one on that lot number one. Carolyn, the first question was about who in the city is responsible for overseeing or um, supervising maintenance plans for stormwater systems. So there, so I, I um, think I heard a couple different things. One is the, you know, as um, the, the maintenance of the infiltration bed will be done by the end users. It's going to be required, recorded um, in the deeds for all the property owners that the, that infiltration area will need to be maintained. Um, we are talking about an existing driveway that already was there. Um, so in fact, the runoff coming from the driveway um, will be reduced, the velocity and the volume will be reduced and be held in the infiltration um, basin. So that is actually an improvement over the existing conditions. Um, so that's not new impervious surface. It's gonna be widened a bit um, at the entrance, but um, what is now running off into the street will net will be captured um, in the future and not run into the street the way it is now. The only thing that's going to be added to that system would be an, one other roof uh, for the lot proposed lot four, um, and there is no proposal to demolish the existing house that would remain. So it's really. Um, two um, new houses um, in addition to the existing um, one there. Um, the, um, the, the there are standards for infiltration. So he, they, they, um, Han, uh, Mr. Hansel did meet the standards for um, what the code requires for stormwater management. And I will tell you regarding the uh, climate crisis that we're under now and the increase of rainfall, we did have a good, the board had a good discussion with the DPW about six or eight weeks ago. And they are recalibrating their kind of, uh, their criteria, you know, with many other communities around these, <laughs> these rainfalls. So they've taken that into consideration. Okay. Um, I think we're all set pretty much. Um, board members, 
Last last question, Mr. Walt, because you are the abutter. So last quite last comment. Unmute yourself. No, please unmute yourself. I have my kids in school hold up signs. Miss Walter, please unmute. They do. Um, the driveway that's the one that will be, not the one right next to me, but the other driveway. There was a question about, will there be garages? And then there was someone brought up, well, it looked like there was something about a small house, but it looked too big to be a driveway. I mean, a garage. There is a, sh it's a nice shed. I don't know if it's a shed, you can say it's a tiny house on that driveway. So on that, so my other concern is, is that going small little structure also being planned to be knocked down and turned into a full out garage? Because that would be another larger structure. And then my other concern with the way I feel the zoning is working as I'm learning so much about Northampton zoning, which is great, is I'm hearing that Joyce, that Cindy's house is not being demolished. But couldn't it just be taken totally down to studs and like something that looks like the one next to me built there? So what, and again, my concern isn't, oh, the danger of the poor hill. My concern is that that hill is not stable. And my personal concern, like I said, over the years has been, is that house going to slide down that hill? So I'm talking about Thank the you. weight of both of those houses. Yep. And the other house yep. would also be on the hill. But I think as a neighborhood, our right. concern is, yes, we hear there's no demolition, but what, what is the nuance of the word demolition? Right. So thank you very much for your, you know, some of this is caveat emptor, buyer beware, who's ever gonna buy that house has to be cognizant of the slope situation. The other issue about the uh, existing house and what happens to that, the landowner, whoever owns that, can do what he or she might want to do within the guidelines of the city. If they're gonna renovate it, if they're gonna tear it down, that's not in our purview. Um, they, they own that house and that's, uh, Every woman's and, house is her castle. So, and I hear you, George, but I think that this just goes back to everyone just not feeling like people are being completely candid about what's going on. And so I feel like nope. that's that's the issue. Yep. So, um, hey, George, are you ready for a motion? We are, we're ready for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Seconded. Any, okay, seconded by Marissa. Any discussion? All right, then we'll go with the roll call, starting with Alan. Yes. And Jenna. Yes. David. Yep. Um, Chris, are you part of this voting uh, ensemble? I'm going to I recuse don't... myself as I wasn't a planning board member at the first hearing. I think he can Thank vote you. to close discussion, though. <laughs> I mean, for what it's Thank worth. You. I for... don't think he has abstained from that. But... <laughs> well, he did. He did. Marissa? What if I vote no? Yes. Yeah, yes. I think it'll still pass. Um, let me see. Where are we here? Uh, Krista. Krista. Yes. All right. Um, did I miss anybody? My George screen has changed a little bit. George votes yes. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Melissa votes yes. Thank you, Melissa. Is Sam still with us? Um. I think he's out eating brisket. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so the oh, he says yes. Sam. Okay. So our public hearing has been closed for this application. Um, any more discussion amidst the board members? Uh, I just would like to, uh, because I was uh, part, part of uh, 
you know, my con my concerns about the the sort of brevity of the application presented to us at the last meeting and the questions around the trees. I do appreciate, I express my thanks to the applicant for coming back with some more detail that those of us who are less uh, uh, the, without the experience and sort of the con construction and design and side of things, uh, I was able to see what was going on and I appreciate addressing the, the tree uh, measure um, I, uh, I, I do, I, I do appreciate that you, you took the time to do that. And I know there was a thought that maybe you might not be able to get back in time for this meeting with that. Uh, but, uh, I, I, I did hear neighbors express, uh, their thoughts on, on the work to look at the tree situation and, and I, I feel better about that situation. So thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, George, I have a comment. Um, I, I hear all the neighbors. I understand their grave concern about the change to their neighborhood. Um, th th there are two points, though, that are, seem important. One is that what is referred to the project of four houses is not really a project of four houses. Two of the houses could be built as a matter of right. They are not, they have nothing to do with the planning board. Um, only lot two uses the driveway, but even that is unnecessary. The people could have parked their car in front of the house and not ever had access to the driveway. So those, two, it's really a project of two houses, one of which exists all, already. Um, and whether it'll be torn down or no, I mean, we have no knowledge or information about that and it's irrelevant. So it's really not a project of four houses. The second thing is, I, I mean, my personal opinion is that the house on lot two is grossly oversized and looks completely out of place the, uh, on lot two. Um, and I wouldn't like to live across the street from it myself. But we have nothing to do about the size of the house. Uh, that's not a zoning matter. It's not before the planning board. So what it comes down to, again, is just the shared driveway. And um, the, driveway was imp the, the driveway was thought to impact the survivability of the trees. And that's how we got into it. And we did get the developer to preserve almost all the trees. And that's a good thing. And uh, I think um, it really comes down to a pretty straightforward um, decision. And I, I don't see what grounds we would have to turn it down. I do think that the, uh, all the recommendations of the arborist should be incorporated, should become part of the permit that's granted and any all the other requirements the DPW. Okay, thank you, Alan. So maybe at this point we go ahead, David. I just want to make an observation. Um, I, 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 I echo most of what Alan just said. Um, I just wanted to, maybe, maybe this is something that has to be more of a sort of a public relations or sort of a public education uh, exercise for you know, Massachusetts generally, or, or really the entire country, in some sense, of the kind of leeway that single family homes have over other types of development. And there would be not even a hearing, really, um, or any process beyond just a little bit of paperwork for anybody who owns any of the single family homes that are probably on this call tonight, if they wanted to demolish their house <coughs> and build exactly the same project that is under, that is being proposed by this developer or being built by this developer. Um, and that is the law of the land. And <laughs> that's not really something we're going to debate in this type of forum. Um, other than just to say, you know, there's lots of news these days about, I like the laws, except when they don't go my way. You know, it's like all over the news today in the Supreme Court. And that's, that's the price of living with laws that apply the same to everybody. 
just because we don't happen to like somebody or we don't want somebody to move in, you know, there's going to be a family moving into that house that doesn't have to totally renovate it. And uh, I think it'll turn out right in the end, even if not every house in all of Northampton is the most beautiful house of all time. Um, and uh, I think we should relish the fact that we have laws that make things simple and easy for people to move on with their lives. And uh, I, I do sympathize with people who have concerns. Um, and I think that's a strong argument in favor of uh, making the public more aware of how the process works. So. Thank you. Um, maybe now is a good time to just look through the conditions that we've discussed over the past two meetings um, to make sure if it does come to a vote, we're all kind of in agreement of that language. Um, Carolyn was pretty good and laid out a draft to us. Um, I'll summarize them real quickly, Karen, unless you want to. Um, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, either way, it's fine. Um, yeah. I can pull that why up. Don't, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Okay, sure. So um, these relate to um, sort of the revisions that came in this week, as well as uh, DPW's um, um, uh, final comments. Um, so I'm just going to um, pull these up. I did have them here. Just uh, one second. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, so originally, um, uh, so again, these have been adjusted. So prior to um, issuance of uh, construction or building permits, um, final construction plan should be submitted to the Office of Planning and Sustainability <clears throat> um, that include the final location type and size for all existing and proposed utilities. Um, prior to issuance of a building permit, so this is, um, you know, um, not necessarily excavation, but actual building permit. The, applica the applicant shall submit a statement from the arbors that all tree protection has been installed in accordance with the recommendations by the arborists. Um, any damage that occurs to the Federal Street slope shall be repaired by the applicant. Um, uh, Prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy for lots two, three, or four, the applicant shall submit easement language in accordance with the zoning for the common maintenance of the driveway, including responsibilities for the utilities underneath um, for review by the Office of Planning and Sustainability. The language should also include maintenance inspection responsibilities for the infiltration stormwater system. Final approved language uh, in these easements shall be recorded at the Registry of Deeds. Um, the um, trees as shown on the plans in compliance with zero lot line requirements, including two trees along the um, street frontages for lots three and four, um, and lots two along Warner Street shall be planted. Um, the applicant shall mitigate any all incremental impacts of traffic by making one time payment in lieu of traffic mitigation and amount of $1,000 to the city of Northampton for the new single family house <clears throat> on lot four. The applicant must provide proof of inspection evaluation by a certified um, uh, uh, professional that uh, the trench drain infiltration system um, is uh, working and functions as designed. Thank Karen, you. one question: the the requirement of um, that no damage be done to the slope would that be uh, during construction? So, is that correct? Yeah, and I don't even know if that actually is still relevant, given that they, um, um, you know, the construction is really. I think that DPW's concern is really about the any kind of foundation hole um, and not the driveway. So um, that would, um, 
that is really it a it's about construction but b i'm not um i'm not so concerned that that should be in the condition because that's a requirement of any developer anywhere any property owner that ha does work on their own private property that damages the public way is responsible for for addressing that so it's it's sort of um it's more than belt and suspenders and it's not really related to the driveway. It did come out of the DPW recommendations, but I don't, um, I don't see it as a, uh, necessary for your permit condition. Okay. Uh, if I, if I may, um, I, you know, looking at this list of conditions, I, um, so first of all, I would, I would agree. I would agree to all of them, even though some of them are sort of belt and suspenders and also, uh, another belt and another set of suspenders um, to use Carolyn's metaphor. Um, and I, I guess what I would point out um, and I'm not the most senior uh, by maybe kind of a lot uh, member of, of the committee, but I will say that this is a number of conditions um, more than we would normally see on this kind of application. And, and I, I would want to let neighbors know that this is a product of this process and your comments and what we have heard. And also I think the DPW's work um, around some of the things that are a little tangential, frankly, to our application, you know, to the application before us, but, um, but it's meaningful to us that we, we do have this opportunity to look at it. And um, so I, I, I guess, so would reassure you that I know some people wanted to slow this down. We don't have um, all the discretion that uh, even if we wanted to, I, 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 I'm, I'm still inclined to, to vote. I will be voting for this with these conditions, but I would just let you all know for those folks who aren't in these meetings all the time and looking at these applications that you know, you, you have been heard, these conditions really are a reflection, not just of what we've done in this meeting, but also kind of a visible reflection of the work that city staff, Carolyn's office, DPW, and, and all the, the entities that look at these projects um, do to, to make safety of the community and the neighborhood and, and all of that is taken into consideration. So I know that everybody's going to be happy with this and we're, we're pretty constrained, I think, in terms of what we do with this application. But I do, I do hope um, that we appreciate your participation and, and I do hope that you, you do see the fruits of your time and your effort in what we are asking of the applicant here. Um, so I would just put that out there that that uh, we're all tired and it's late, but I I do appreciate the civic um, effort that goes into something like this. So thank you all for for being here. We have heard you, even even if we are not able to go your way. Thank you, Marissa. Well, I'll just piggyback on that, you know, I think I've learned a lot through this process also. I think there are some bumps in the process in the past with the applicant perhaps. Um, and I think what I've learned on my time on a planning board is these zoning ordinances, regulations, guidelines are a living, really a living kind of thing. Um, and they evolve over time. I think it was very apt that we heard from um, ex-counselor uh, Geisland today who years ago was a proponent of infill. And now as he's seen it evolve, he wonders if perhaps there aren't ways that we need to tweak that. So this conversation is happening in neighborhoods all across the city. Um, so we constantly are looking at the zoning ordinances as we did earlier tonight, downtown Northampton and Florence to see how we can make them better align with what our city's doing and what our, what's happening to our environment. Um, but it is, to, as Marissa aptly said, you know, citizens like yourselves who help to keep this, um, help to keep us informed too. So uh, appreciate all of your diligence and your research um, while you're here. And I hope that uh, depending how this goes, you will have some new neighbors and they will in time integrate themselves into your community. Um, any last little pulpit talks from uh, planning board? 
All right. I have, I have one I just... tiny thing, George. Chris. Um, even though I'm not going to be voting, I just think, Carolyn, you had mentioned that the condition of the tree protection prior to building permit. And if an excavation permit is required for the foundation, I think it would be better to do it prior to the excavation permit, just because that's going to be a bulk of the of the tree endangering activities. Yeah, it's yeah. written right in there. If you read the first page, Chris, that all the work has to be done before, prior to the construction. Okay. I just want to make sure the conditions reflect the... Yeah, we've got, like I said, we've already started all, uh, as far as aerating the roots, cutting up every, uh, cutting the roots so they won't get uh, torn out during construction. Okay. John, the public so hearing is over. Shouldn't... Oh, Carolyn, wow. can, you, can you make that change? Yes. Uh, well, okay. you guys haven't voted on it yet, so you right. can make the change. <laughs> so, the, so when we vote on it, that uh, one is amended um, to prior to the excavation of the foundation, all tree um, protection and mitigation will have taken place. But I would note that public discussion is closed, so right. we the right. committee needs to we need to the board needs to keep our discussions amongst ourselves. Any other discussion before we hear a motion? Very, very quickly, I just want to thank um, both Marissa and George for their comments and encourage all of you who came. I think we see a lot of people coming out feeling uh, very rightly, very passionate about things that are happening in their own neighborhoods, but this is happening all over the city and we're constantly trying to figure out how to make Northampton a sustainable community and a good place for people to live. So please take this interest and all the things that you've learned and the research that you've done and continue to participate in these conversations. Sign up for the Office of Planning and Sustainability newsletter, look at public forums, come and participate and lend your voices to further conversations that might not be happening you know, next door or across the street from you, but that nevertheless um, have an impact. We do hear you, we do value that and please keep coming forward, it really matters. Thank you, Jenna. Sam? Uh, I'd like to make a motion to, uh, to accept the, uh, the applicant's application with the, with the amendment stated. For the shared driveway at 170 Federal Street? Yeah, that one. Okay. So there's a motion to accept the uh, application for the shared driveway. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Alan. Any discussion on the motion? And Chris will be abstaining. All right, hearing none, we'll go through a roll call and I'll start with Alan. Yes. And Jenna. Yes. David? Yep. Okay, Marissa? Yes. And Sam? Yeah. And Krista? Yes. Okay, Melissa? Yes. Okay, and the chair votes yes also. So it's unanimous with one abstention. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for your efforts. Um, And please, as has been said, please uh, keep up this conversation with your city councilors, your neighbors, future developers. And we'll thank, you. thank you. Thank you on behalf of New Way Homes to the board for your time and to the neighbors for your participation in the process. Thank you. All right, Carolyn, I think we have one other small item of business, maybe a, uh, approval. Of Krista, hold on. <laughs> Approval of some minutes. I didn't say anything. No, that was me. That was me. Uh, all right. <laughs> anyway, I the thought... minutes. I think we can do that. That's fine. <laughs> um, so from November. Okay. Move we approve the minutes. I second. I approve. I third. <laughs> All righty, those are the minutes of November 12th, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's been a motion made to approve the minutes of November 12th without any edits. Um, Alan? Yep. Jenna? 
Yes. David. Yes. Okay, Chris, you'll probably have stayed too. Sure. Um, Marissa. <laughs> Surely, yes. Don't call me Shirley. Uh, <laughs> Sam. Sam says yes. Uh, Krista. Yes. And Melissa. Yes. Okay, and the minutes are approved unanimously. Is there any other business that can come before the planning board tonight? Go home. <laughs> I move to close the meeting. All right, motion to adjourn the meeting at 10.55. Is there a second? second? Second, third. All right. Real quickly then, Alan. Yeah, sure. Jana. Yes. David. Yep. Chris. Yes. And Marissa. Yes. And Melissa. Yes. And Krista. Yes. And Sam, another unanimous vote. All okay. right. Bye.